Preface to Endymion by John Keats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Endymion, a poetic romance by John Keats. The stretched meter of an antique song inscribed to the memory of thomas chatterton preface knowing within myself the manner in which this poem has been produced it is not without a feeling of regret that i make it public what manner i mean will be quite clear to the reader who must soon perceive great inexperience immaturity and every error denoting a feverish attempt rather than a deed accomplished the two first books and indeed the two last i feel sensible are not of such completion as to warrant their passing the press nor should they if i thought a year's castigation would do them any good it will not the foundations are too sandy it is just that this youngster should die away a sad thought for me if i had not some hope that while it is dwindling i may be plotting and fitting myself for verses fit to live this may be speaking too presumptuously and may deserve a punishment but no feeling man will be forward to inflict it he will leave me alone with the conviction that there is not a fiercer hell than the failure in a great object this is not written with the least atom of purpose to forestall criticisms of course but from the desire i have to conciliate men who are competent to look and who do look with a zealous eye to the honour of english literature the imagination of a boy is healthy and the mature imagination of a man is healthy but there is a space of life between in which the soul is in a ferment the character undecided the way of life uncertain the ambition thick-sighted thence proceeds mawkishness and all the thousand bitters which those men i speak of must necessarily taste in going over the following pages i hope i have not in too late a day touched the beautiful mythology of greece and dulled its brightness for i wish to try once more before i bid it farewell tinmouth april ten eighteen eighteen end of preface section one of endymion this librivox recording is in the public domain endymion by john keats book one lines one to two hundred and twenty two a thing of beauty is a joy for ever its loveliness increases it will never pass into nothingness but still will keep a bower quiet for us and a sleep full of sweet dreams and health and quiet breathing therefore on every morrow are we wreathing a flowery band to bind us to the earth spite of despondence of the inhuman dearth of noble natures of the gloomy days of all the unhealthy and or darkened ways made for our searching yes in spite of all some shape of beauty moves away the pall from our dark spirits such the sun the moon trees old and young sprouting a shady boon for simple sheep and such are daffodils with the green world they live in and clear rills that for themselves a cooling covert make gainst the hot season the mid forest break rich with a sprinkling of fair musk rose blooms and such too is the grandeur of the dooms we have imagined for the mighty dead 
all lovely tales that we have heard or read an endless fountain of immortal drink pouring unto us from the heaven's brink nor do we merely feel these essences for one short hour no even as the trees that whisper round a temple become soon dear as the temple's self so does the moon the passion's posy glories infinite haunt us till they become a cheering light unto our souls and bound to us so fast that whether there be shine or gloom or cast they always must be with us or we die therefore tis with full happiness that i will trace the story of endymion the very music of the name has gone into my being and each pleasant scene is growing fresh before me as the green of our own valleys so i will begin now while i cannot hear the city's din now while the early budders are just new and run in mazes of the youngest hue about old forests while the willow trails its delicate amber and the dairy pails bring home increase of milk and as the year grows lush in juicy stalks i'll smoothly steer my little boat for many quiet hours with streams that deepen freshly into bowers many and many a verse i hope to write before the daisies vermel rimmed and white hide in deep herbage and ere yet the bees hum about globes of clover and sweet peas i must be near the middle of my story oh may no wintry season bare and hoary see it half finished but let autumn bold with universal tinge of sober gold be all about me when i make an end and now at once adventuresome i send my herald thought into a wilderness there let its trumpet blow and quickly dress my uncertain path with green that i may speed easily onward thorough flowers and weed upon the sides of latmos was outspread a mighty forest for the moist earth fed so plenteously all weed-hidden roots into o'erhanging boughs and precious fruits and it had gloomy shades sequestered deep where no man went and if from shepherd's keep a lamb strayed far adown those inmost glens never again saw he the happy pens whither his brethren bleating with content over the hills at every nightfall went among the shepherds twas believed ever that not one fleecy lamb which thus did sever from the white flock but passed unworried by angry wolf or parred with prying head until it came to some unfooted plains where fed the herds of pan i great his gains who thus one lamb did lose paths there were many winding through palmy fern and rushes fenny and ivy banks all leading pleasantly to a wide lawn whence one could only see stems thronging all around between the swell of turf and slanting branches who could tell the freshness of the space of heaven above edged round with dark tree tops through which a dove would often beat its wings and often too a little cloud would move across the blue full in the middle of this pleasantness there stood a marble altar with a tress of flowers budded newly 
and the dew had taken fairy fantasies to strew daisies upon the sacred sward last eve and so the dawned light in pomp receive for twas the morn apollo's upward fire made every eastern cloud a silvery pyre of brightness so unsullied that therein a melancholy spirit well might win oblivion and melt out his essence fine into the winds rain-scented eglantine gave temperate sweets to that well-wooing sun the lark was lost in him cold springs had run to warm their chilliest bubbles in the grass man's voice was on the mountains and the mass of nature's lives and wonders pulsed tenfold to feel this sunrise and its glories old now while the silent workings of the dawn were busiest into this self-same lawn or suddenly with joyful cries there sped a troop of little children garlanded who gathering round the altar seemed to pry earnestly round as wishing to espy some folk of holiday nor had they waited for many moments ere their ears were sated with a faint breath of music which e'en then filled out its voice and died away again within a little space again it gave its airy swellings with a gentle wave to light-hung leaves in smoothest echoes breaking through copse-clad valleys ere their death or taking the surgy murmurs of the lonely sea and now as deep into the wood as we might mark a lynx's eye there glimmered light fair faces and a rush of garments white plainer and plainer showing till at last into the widest alley they all passed making directly for the woodland altar o oh, kindly muse let not my weak tongue falter in telling of this goodly company of their old piety and of their glee but let a portion of ethereal dew fall on my head and presently unmew my soul that i may dare in wayfaring to stammer where old chaucer used to sing leading the way young damsels danced along bearing the burden of a shepherd's song each having a white wicker over brimmed with april's tenderest younglings next well trimmed a crowd of shepherds with as sunburnt looks as may be read of in arcadian books such as sat listening round apollo's pipe when the great deity for earth too ripe let his divinity or flowing die in music through the vales of thessaly some idly trailed their sheep hooks on the ground and some kept up a shrilly mellow sound with ebon tipped flutes close after these now coming from beneath the forest trees a venerable priest full soberly begirt with ministering looks alway his eye steadfast upon the matted turf he kept and after him his sacred vestments swept from his right hand there swung a vase milk-white of mingled wine out sparkling generous light and in his left he held a basket full of all sweet herbs that searching eye could cull wild thyme and valley lilies whiter still than leda's love and cresses from the rill his aged head crowned with beechen wreath seemed like a pole of ivy in the teeth of winter hoar then came another crowd of shepherds lifting in due time aloud 
their share of the ditty after them appeared up followed by a multitude that reared their voices to the clouds a fair rock car easily rolling so as scarce to mar the freedom of three steeds of dapple brown who stood therein did seem of great renown among the throng his youth was fully blown showing like ganymede to manhood grown and for those simple times his garments were a chieftain king's beneath his breast half bare were hung a silver bugle and between his nervy knees there lay a boar-spear keen a smile was on his countenance he seemed to common lookers-on like one who dreamed of idleness in groves elysian but there were some who feelingly could scan a lurking trouble in his nether lip and see that oftentimes the reins would slip through his forgotten hands then would they sigh and think of yellow leaves of owlets cry of locks piled solemnly ah well a day why should our young endymion pine away soon the assembly in a circle ranged stood silent round the shrine each look was changed to sudden veneration women meek beckon their sons to silence while each cheek of virgin bloom paled gently for slight fear endymion too without a forest peer stood wan and pale and with an awed face among his brothers of the mountain chase in midst of all the venerable priest eyed them with joy from greatest to the least and after lifting up his aged hands thus spake he men of latmos shepherd bands whose care it is to guard a thousand flocks whether descended from beneath the rocks that overtop your mountains whether come from valleys where the pipe is never dumb or from your swelling downs where sweet air stirs blue harebells lightly and where prickly furs buds lavish gold or ye whose precious charge nibble their fill at ocean's very marge whose mellow reeds are touched with sounds forlorn by the dim echoes of old triton's horn mothers and wives who day by day prepare the scrip with needments for the mountain air and all ye gentle girls who foster up udderless lambs and in a little cup will put choice honey for a favoured youth yea every one attend for in good truth our vows are wanting to our great god pan are not our lowing heifers sleeker than night-swollen mushrooms are not our wide plains speckled with countless fleeces have not rains greened over april's lap no howling sad sickens our fearful ewes and we have had great bounty from endymion our lord the earth is glad the merry lark has poured his early song against yon breezy sky that spreads so clear o'er our solemnity end of section one read by alan mapstone Section two of Endymion. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Larry Wilson. Endymion by John Keats. Book one, lines two hundred twenty three to four hundred eighty eight. Thus ending on the shrine, he'd heaped a spire of teeming sweets in kindling sacred fire. Anon he stained the thick and spongy sod with wine in honor of the shepherd god now while the earth was drinking it and while bay leaves were crackling in the fragrant pile 
and gummy frankincense was sparkling bright neath smothering parsley and a hazy light spread greyly eastward thus a chorus sang o thou whose mighty palace roof doth hang from jagged trunks and overshadoweth eternal whispers glooms the birth life death of unseen flowers and heavy peacefulness who loves to see the hammered dryads dress the ruffled locks where meeting hazels darken and through whole solemn hours doth sit and hearken the dreary melody of bedded reeds in desolate places where dank moisture breeds the pipy hemlock to strange overgrowth bethinking thee how melancholy loath thou wast to lose fair syrinx do thou now by thy love's milky brow by all the trembling mazes that she ran hear us great pan o thou for whose soul soothing quiet turtles passion their voices coolingly mong myrtles what time thou wanderest at eventide through sunny meadows that outskirt the side of thine embossed realms o thou to whom broad-leaved fig-trees even now foredoom their ripened fruitage yellow girted bees their golden honeycombs our village lees their fairest blossomed beans and poppied corn the chuckling linnet its five young unborn to sing for thee low creeping strawberries their summer coolness pent up butterflies their freckled wings yea the fresh budding year all its completions be quickly near by every wind that nods the mountain pine o forest divine thou to whom every fawn and satyr flies for willing service whether to surprise the squatted hare while in half sleeping fit or upward ragged precipices flit to save poor lambkins from the eagle's maw or by mysterious enticement draw bewildered shepherds to their path again or to tread breathless round the frothy main and gather up all the fancifulest shells for thee to tumble into naiad cells and being hidden laugh at their outpeeping or to delight thee with fantastic leaping the while they pelt each other on the crown with silvery oak apples and fir cones brown by all the echoes that about thee ring hear us o satyr king o hearkener to the loud clapping shears while ever and anon to his shorn peers a ram goes bleating winder of the horn when snouted wild boars rotting tender corn anger our hutsmen breather round our farms to keep off mildews and all weather harms strange ministrant of undescribed sounds that come a-swooning over hollow grounds and wither drearily on barren moors dread opener of the mysterious doors leading to universal knowledge see great son of dryope the many that are come to pay their vows with leaves about their brows be still the unimaginable lodge for solitary thinkings such as dodge conception to the very born of heaven then leave the naked brain be still the leaven that spreading in this dull and clouded earth gives it a touch ethereal a new birth be still a symbol of immensity a firmament reflected in a sea an element filling the space between an unknown but no more we humbly screen with uplift hands our foreheads lowly bending and giving out a shout most heaven-rending conjure thee to receive our humble peon upon thy mount lycian even while they brought the burden to a close a shout from the whole multitude arose that lingered in the air like dying rolls of abrupt thunder when ionian shoals of dolphins bobbed their noses through the brine meantime on shady levels mossy fine young companies nimbly began dancing to the swift treble pipe and humming string ay those fair living forms swam heavenly to tunes forgotten out of memory fair creatures whose young children's children read thermopylae its heroes not yet dead but in old marbles ever beautiful high genitors unconscious did they call time's sweet first fruits they danced to weariness and then in quiet circles did they press the hillock turf and caught the latter end of some strange history 
potent to send a young mind from its bodily tenement or they might watch the quoit pitchers intent on either side pitying the sad death of hyacinthus when the cruel breath of zephyr slew him zephyr penitent who now ere phoebus mounts the firmament fondles the flower amid the sobbing rain the archers too upon a wider plain beside the feathery whizzing of the shaft and the dull twanging bowstring and the raft branch down sweeping from a tall ash top called up a thousand thoughts to envelop those who would watch perhaps the trembling knee and frantic gape of lonely niobe poor lonely niobe when her lovely young were dead and gone and her caressing tongue lay a lost thing upon her paley lip and very very deadliness did nip her motherly cheeks aroused from this sad mood by one who at a distance loud hallooed uplifting his strong bow into the air many nights after brighter visions stare after the argonauts in blind amaze tossing about on neptune's restless ways until from the horizon's vaulted side there shot a golden splendor far and wide spangling those million poutings of the brine with quivering ore twas even an awful shine from the exaltation of apollo's bow a heavenly beacon in their dreary woe who thus were ripe for high contemplating might turn their steps toward the sober ring where sat endymion and the aged priest among shepherds gone in eld whose looks increased the silvering seti of their mortal star there they discoursed upon the fragile bar that keeps us from our homes ethereal and what our duties there to nightly call vesper the beauty crest of summer weather to summon all the downiest clouds together for the sun's purple couch to emulate in many string the potent rule of fate with speed of fire-tailed exaltations to tint her pallid cheek with bloom who cons sweet poesy by moonlight beside these a world of other unguessed offices anon they wandered by divine converse into elysium vying to rehearse each one his own anticipated bliss one felt heart certain that he could not miss his quick gone love among fair blossomed boughs where every zephyr sigh pouts and endows her lips with music for the welcoming another wished mid that eternal spring to meet his rosy child with feathery sails sweeping eye earnestly through almond vales who suddenly should stoop through the smooth wind and with the balmiest leaves his temples bind and ever after through those regions be his messenger his little mercury some were athirst in soul to see again their fellow huntsmen o'er the wide champagne in times long past to sit with them and talk of all the chances in their earthly walk comparing joyfully their plenteous stores of happiness to when upon the moors benighted close they huddled from the cold and shared their famished scripts thus all out told their fond imaginations saving him whose eyelids curtained up their jewels dim endymion yet hourly had he striven to hide the cankering venom that had riven his fainting recollections now indeed his senses had swooned off he did not heed the sudden silence or the whispers low or the old eyes dissolving at his woe or anxious calls or close of trembling palms or maiden sigh that grief itself embalms but in the self-same fixed trance he kept like one who on the earth had never slept i even as dead still as a marble man frozen in that old tale arabian who whispers him so pantingly and close peona his sweet sister of all those his friends the dearest hushing signs she made and breathed a sister sorrow to persuade a yielding up a cradling on her care her eloquence did breathe away the curse she led him like some midnight spirit nurse of happy changes in emphatic dreams along a path between two little streams guarding his forehead with her round elbow from low-grown branches and his footsteps slow from stumbling over stumps and hillocks small until they came to where these streamlets fall with mingled bubblings and a gentle rush 
into a river clear brimful and flush with crystal mocking of the trees and sky a little shallop floating there hard by pointed its beak over the fringed bank and soon it lightly dipped and rose and sank and dipped again with the young couple's weight peona guiding through the water straight towards a bowery island opposite which gaining presently she steered light into a shady fresh and ripply cove where nested was an arbor overwove by many a summer's silent fingering to whose cool bosom she was used to bring her playmates with their needle broidery and minstrel memories of times gone by so she was gently glad to see him laid under her favorite bower's quiet shade on her own couch new made of flower leaves dried carefully on the cooler side of sheaves when last the sun his autumn tresses shook and the tanned harvester's rich armfuls took soon was he quieted to slumbrous rest but ere it crept upon him he had pressed peona's busy hand against his lips and still a-sleeping held her finger-tips in tender pressure and as a willow keeps a patient watch over the stream that creeps windingly by it so the quiet maid held her in peace so that a whispering blade of grass a wailful gnat a bee bustling down in bluebells or a wren light rustling among sere leaves and twigs might all be heard o oh, magic sleep o oh, comfortable bird that buddhist o'er the troubled sea of the mind till it is hushed and smooth o unconfined restraint imprisoned liberty great key to golden palaces strange minstrelsy fountains grotesque new trees bespangled caves echoing grottoes full of tumbling waves and moonlight i to all the mazy world of silvery enchantment who upfurled beneath thy drowsy wing a triple hour but renovates and lives thus in the bower endymion was calmed to life again opening his eyelids with a healthier brain he said i feel this thine endearing love all through my bosom thou art as a dove trembling its closed eyes and sleeked wings about me and the pearliest dew not brings such morning incense from the fields of may as do those brighter drops that twinkling stray from those kind eyes the very home and haunt of sisterly affection can i want aught else aught nearer heaven than such tears yet dry them up and bidding hence all fears that any longer i will pass my days alone and sad no i will once more raise my voice upon the mountain heights once more make my horn parley from their foreheads hoar again my trooping hounds their tongues shall lull around the breathed boar again i'll pull the fair-grown yew tree for a chosen bow and when the pleasant sun is getting low again i'll linger in a sloping mead to hear the speckled thrushes and see feed our idle sheep so be thou cheered sweet and if thy lute is here softly entreat my soul to keep in its resolved course in the section two Section three of Endymion. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Stevens. Endymion by John Keats. Book one, lines four eight nine to seven hundred and ten. Harriet Peona, in their silver source, shut her pure sorrow drops with glad exclaim, and took a lute from which there pulsing came a lively prelude fashioning the way in which her voice should wander twas a lay more subtle cadenced more forest wild than dryope's lone lulling of her child and nothing since has floated in the air so mournful strange surely some influence rare went spiritual through the damsel's hand for still with delphic emphasis she spanned the quick invisible strings even though she saw endymion's spirit melt away and thaw before the deep intoxication 
but soon she came, with sudden burst, upon her self-possession, swung the lute aside and earnestly said, Brother, tis vain to hide that thou dost know of things mysterious, immortal, starry. Such alone could thus weigh down thy nature. Hast thou sinned in aught offensive to the heavenly powers, caught a Paphian dove upon a message sent, thy dreadful bow against some dear herd bent, sacred to Dian? Haply thou hast seen her naked limbs amongst the elders green, and that, alas, is death. No, I can trace something more hyperplexing in thy face. Endymion looked at her and pressed her hand and said, Art thou so pale, who wast so bland and merry in our meadows? How is this? Tell me thine ailment. Tell me all amiss. Ah, thou hast been unhappy at the change, wrought suddenly in me. What indeed more strange, or more complete, to overwhelm surmise? Ambition is no sluggard, tis no prize, that toiling years would put within my grasp, that I have sighed for with so deadly gasp, no man e'er panted for a mortal love. So all have set my heavier grief above these things which happen. Rightly have they done. I who saw the horizontal sun heave his broad shoulder o'er the edge of the world, outfacing Lucifer, and then had hurled my spear aloft as signal for the chase. I, who for very sport of heart would race with my own steed from Araby, pluck down a vulture from his towery perching, frown a lion into growling, loathe retire to lose at once all my toil-breeding fire, and sink thus low, but I will ease my breast of secret grief here in this bowery nest. This river does not see the naked sky, till it begins to progress silverly around the western border of the wood, whence from a certain spot its winding flood seems at the distance like a crescent moon, and in that nook the very pride of June had I been used to pass my weary eves, the rather for the sun unwilling leaves so dear a picture of his sovereign power, and I could witness his most kingly hour when he doth lighten up the golden reins, and paces leisurely down his amber plains, his snorting four, now when his chariot last its beams against the zodiac lion cast, there blossomed suddenly a magic bed of sacred ditomy and poppies red, at which I wondered greatly, knowing well that but one night had wrought this flowery spell, and sitting down close by, began to muse what it might mean. Perhaps, thought I, Morpheus, in passing here his owlet pinion shook, or it may be, ere matron night uptook her ebon urn, young Mercury, by stealth, had dipped his rod in it. Such garland wealth came not by common growth. Thus on I thought, until my head was dizzy and distraught, Moreover, through the dancing poppies stole a breeze most softly lulling to my soul, and shaping visions all about my sight of colours, wings, and bursts of spangly light, the which became more strange and strange and dim, and then were gulfed in a tumultuous swim, and then I asleep. Ah, can I tell the enchantment that afterwards befell? Yet it was but a dream, yet such a dream that never tongue, although it overteem with mellow utterance like a cavern spring, could figure out and to conception bring all I beheld and felt. Methought I lay watching the zenith, where the Milky Way among the stars in virgin splendour pours, and travelling my eye until the doors of heaven appeared to open for my flight. I became loath and fearful to alight, 
from such high soaring by a downward glance, so kept me steadfast in that airy trance, spreading imaginary pinions wide. When, presently, the stars began to glide and faint away before my eager view, at which I sighed that I could not pursue and dropped my vision to the horizon's verge, and lo, from opening clouds I saw emerge the loveliest moon that ever silvered o'er a shell for Neptune's goblet. She did soar so passionately bright, my dazzled soul, commingling with her argent spheres, did roll through clear and cloudy, even when she went at last into a dark and vapoury tent, whereat methought the lidless eyed train of planets all were in the blue again. To commune with those orbs, once more I raised my sight right upward. But it was quite dazed by a bright something, sailing down apace, making me quickly veil my eyes and face. Again I looked, and, O oh, ye deities, who from Olympus watch our destinies, whence that completed form of all completeness? Whence came that high perfection of all sweetness? Speak, stubborn earth, and tell me where, O oh, where hast thou a symbol of her golden hair? Not oat sheaves drooping in the western sun, not thy soft hand, fair sister. Let me shun such follying before thee. Yet she had indeed locks bright enough to make me mad, and they were simply gordianed up and braided, leaving in naked comeliness unshaded her pearl-round ears, white neck, and orbed brow, the which were blended in, I know not how, with such a paradise of lips and eyes, blush-tinted cheeks, half-smiles and fairest sighs, that, when I think thereon, my spirit clings, and plays about its fancy, till the stings of human neighbourhood envenom all. Upon what awful power shall I call? To what high fane? Ah, see her hovering feet, more bluely veined, more soft, more whitely sweet, than those of sea-born Venus, when she rose from out her cradle shell. The wind outblows her scarf into a fluttering pavilion. Tis blue and overspangled, with a million of little eyes, as thou thou wert to shed over the darkest, lushest bluebell bed, handfuls of daisies. Endymion, how strange, dream within dream! She took an airy range, and then, towards me, like a very maid, came, blushing, waning, willing and afraid, and pressed me by the hand. Ah! "'Twas too much. Methought I fainted at the charmed touch, "'yet held my recollection, "'even as one who dives three fathoms where the waters run, "'gurgling in beds of coral. "'For anon I felt upmounted in that region "'where falling stars dart their artillery forth, "'and eagles struggle with the buffeting north "'that balances the heavy meteor stone.' Felt, too, I was not fearful nor alone, But lapped and lulled along the dangerous sky, Soon as it seemed we left our journeying high, And straightway into frightful eddies swooped, Such as I muster where grey time has scooped, Huge dens and caverns in a mountain side, There hollow sounds aroused me, and I sighed, to faint once more by looking on my bliss. I was distracted, madly did I kiss the wooing arms which held me, and did give my eyes at once to death. But t'was to live, to take in draughts of life from the gold fount, of kind and passionate looks, to count and count the moments by some greedy help that seemed a second self that each might be redeemed and plundered of its load of blessedness. 
Ah, desperate mortal, I even dared to press her very cheek against my crowned lip, and at that moment felt my body dip into a warmer air a moment more. Our feet were soft in flowers. There was store of newest joys upon that alp. Sometimes a scent of violets and blossoming limes loitered around us, then of honey cells made delicate from all white flower bells, and once above the edges of our nest an arch face peeped, an orid as I guessed. Why did I dream that sleep overpowered me in midst of all this heaven? Why not see far off the shadows of his pinions dark and stare them from me? But no, like a spark that needs must die, although its little beam reflects upon a diamond, my sweet dream fell into nothing, into stupid sleep. And so it was, until a gentle creep, a careful moving, caught my waking ears, and up I started. Ah, my sighs, my tears, my clenched hands, for lo, the poppies hung, dew dabbled on their stalks, the owl sung a heavy ditty, and the sullen day had chidden herald Hesperus away, with leaden looks the solitary breeze blustered and slept and its wild self did tease with wayward melancholy. And I thought, mark me, Peona, that sometimes it brought faint fairy wells and sigh-shrilled adieus. Away I wandered all the pleasant hues of heaven and earth had faded, deepest shades were deepest dungeons, heaths and sunny glades were full of pestilent light, our taintless rills seemed sooty and o'erspread with upturned gills of dying fish. The vermeil rose had blown in frightful scarlet, and its thorns outgrown like spiked aloe. If an innocent bird before my heedless footsteps stirred and stirred in little journeys, I beheld in it a disguised demon missioned to knit my soul with under-darkness, to entice my stumblings down some monstrous precipice. Therefore I eager followed, and did curse the disappointment. Time, that aged nurse, rocked me to patience. Now, thank gentle heaven, these things with all their comfortings are given to my down-sunken hours, and with thee, sweet sister, help to stem the ebbing sea of weary life. End of section three. Section four of Endymion. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Endymion by John Keats. Book one, lines 711 to 993. Thus ended he, and both sat silent, for the maid was very loath to answer, feeling well that breathed words would all be lost, unheard and vain as swords, against the enchased crocodile or leaps of grasshoppers against the sun. She weeps, and wonders, struggles to devise some blame, to put on such a look as would say, Shame on this poor weakness! But for all her strife, she could as soon have crushed away the life from a sick dove. At length, to break the pause, she said with trembling chance, Is this the cause, this all? Yet it is strange and sad, alas, that one who through this middle earth should pass most like a sojourning demigod and leave his name upon the harp-string should achieve no higher bard than simple maidenhood. Singing alone and fearfully, how the blood left his young cheek, and how he used to stray he knew not where, and how he would say, Nay, if any said twas love, and yet twas love, what could it be but love? How a ring dove let fall a sprig of yew tree in his path, and how he died, and then, that love doth scathe the gentle heart, 
as northern blasts do roses, and then the ballad of his sad life closes with sighs and an alas, and Dimion be rather in the trumpet's mouth anon among the winds at large, that all may hearken, although before the crystal heavens darken I watch and dote upon the silver lakes pictured in western cloudiness that takes the semblance of gold rocks and bright gold sands, islands and creeks and amber-fretted strands, with horses prancing o'er them, palaces and towers of amethyst. Would I so tease my pleasant days, because I could not mount into those regions? The Morphian fount of that fine element and visions, dreams, and fitful whims of sleep are made of streams, into its airy channels with so subtle, so thin a breathing, not the spider's shuttle, circled a million times within the space of a swallow's nest door, could delay a trace, a tinting of its quality. How light must dreams themselves be, seeing they're more slight than the mere nothing that engenders them. Then wherefore sully the entrusted gem of high and noble life with thoughts so sick. Why pierce high-fronted honor to the quick for nothing but a dream? Hereat the youth looked up. A conflicting of shame and ruth was in his plated brow, yet his eyelids widened a little as when Zephyr bids a little breeze to creep between the fans of careless butterflies. Amid his pains he seemed to taste a drop of manadew, full palatable, and a color grew upon his cheek, while thus he life full spake. Piona, ever have I longed to slake my thirst for the world's praises. Nothing base, no merely slumbrous phantasm, could unlace the stubborn canvas for my voyage prepared though now tis tattered, leaving my bark bared, and sullenly drifting, yet my higher hope is of too wide, too rainbow-large a scope, to fret at myriads of earthly wrecks. Wherein lies happiness, in that which becks our ready minds to fellowship divine, a fellowship with essence, till we shine full alchemized and free of space. Behold, the clear religion of heaven, fold a rose-leaf round thy finger's taperness and soothe thy lips. Hist! When the airy stress of music's kiss impregnates the free winds, and with a sympathetic touch unbinds Aeolian magic from their lucid wombs. Then old songs waken from enclouded tombs, Old ditties sigh above their father's grave. Ghosts of melodious prophesyings rave Round every spot where trod Apollo's foot. Bronze clarions awake and faintly brute Where long ago a giant battle was, And from the turf a lullaby doth pass In every place where infant Orpheus slept. Feel we these things, that moment have we stepped into a sort of oneness, and our state is like a floating spirit's. But there are richer entanglements, enthrallments far more self-destroying, leading by degrees to the chief intensity. The crown of these is made of love and friendship, and sits high upon the forehead of humanity. All its more ponderous and bulky worth is friendship whence there ever issues forth a steady splendor, but at the tip-top there hangs by unseen film an orbit drop of light, and that is love, its influence, thrown in our eyes, genders a novel sense, at which we start and fret, till in the end, melting into its radiance, we blend, mingle, and so become a part of it. Nor with aught else can our souls interknit, so wingedly, when we combine therewith, life's self is nourished by its proper pith, and we are nurtured like a pelican brood. 
I so delicious is the unsating food, that men who might have towered in the van of all the congregated world to fan and winnow from the coming step of time all chaff of custom, wipe away all slime, left by men slugs and human serpentry, have been content to let occasion die whilst they did sleep in love's Elysium. And truly I would rather be struck dumb than speak against this ardent listlessness, for I have ever thought that it might bless the world with benefits unknowingly, as does the nightingale up perched high and cloistered among cool and bunched leaves. She sings but to her love, nor e'er conceives how tiptoe night holds back her dark grey hood. Just so may love, although tis understood, the mere commingling of passionate breath, produce more than our searching witnesseth. What I know not, but who of men can tell that flowers would bloom, or that green fruit would swell, to melting pulp, that fish would have bright mail, the earth its dower of river, wood, and vale, the meadows runnels, runnels pebble stones, the seeds its harvest, or the lute its tones, tones ravishment, or ravishment its sweet, if human souls did never kiss and greet. Now if this earthly love has power to make men's being mortal immortal, to shake ambition from their memories, and brim their measure of content, what merest whim seems all this poor endeavour after fame, to one who keeps within his steadfast aim a love immortal, and immortal too. Look not so wildered, for these things are true, and never can be born of atomies that buzz about our slumbers like brain flies, leaving us fancy sick. No, no, I'm sure, my restless spirit never could endure to brood so long upon one luxury, unless it did, though fearfully, espy a hope beyond the shadow of a dream. My sayings will the less obscured seem when I have told thee how my waking sight has made me scruple whether that same night was passed in dreaming. Hearken, sweet Piona, beyond the matron temple of Latona, which we should see but for these darkening boughs, lies a deep hollow from whose ragged brows bushes and trees do lean all round athwart, and meet so nearly that with wings outwrought and spreaded tail a vulture could not glide past them but he must brush on every side. Some mouldered steps lead into this cool cell, far as the slabbed margin of a well, whose patient level peeps its crystal eye right upward through the bushes to the sky. Oft have I brought thee flowers on their stalks set like vestal primroses, but dark velvet edges them round, and they have golden pits. Twas there I got them from the gaps and slits in a mossy stone that sometimes was my seat when all above was faint with midday heat, and there in strife no burning thoughts to heed, I'd bubble up the water through a reed, so reaching back to boyhood make me ships of molted feathers, touchwood, alder chips, with leaves stuck in them, and the Neptune be of their petty ocean, oftener heavily, when love-lorn hours had left me less a child, I sat contemplating the figures wild, of o'erhead clouds melting the mirror through. Upon a day, while thus I watched, by flew a cloudy cupid with his bow and quiver, so plainly charactered no breeze would shiver the happy chance, so happy I was fain to follow it upon the open plain, and therefore was just going when, behold, a wonder fair as any I have told, the same bright face I tasted in my sleep smiling in the clear well. My heart did leap through the cool depth. It moved as if to flee. I started up when, lo, refreshfully, there came upon my face in plenteous showers dew drops and dewy buds and leaves and flowers. 
wrapping all objects from my smothered sight, bathing my spirit in a new delight. I, such a breathless honey feel of bliss, alone preserved me from the drear abyss of death, for the fair form had gone again. Pleasure is oft a visitant, but pain clings cruelly to us like the gnawing sloth on the deer's tender haunches, late and loath, to scared away by slow returning pleasure. How sickening, how dark the dreadful leisure of weary days, made deeper exquisite by a foreknowledge of unslumberous night. Like sorrow came upon me, heavier still, than when I wandered from the poppy hill, and a whole age of lingering moments crept sluggishly by, ere more contentment swept away at once the deadly yellow spleen. Yes, thrice have I this fair enchantment seen, once more been tortured with renewed life, when last the wintry gusts gave over strife with the conquering sun of spring, and left the skies warm and serene, but yet with moistened eyes in pity of the shattered infant buds, that time thou didst adorn with amber studs my hunting cap because I laughed and smiled, chatted with thee, and many days exiled all torment from my breast. T'was even then, straying about, yet cooped up in the den of helpless discontent, hurling my lance from place to place, and following at chance, at last by hap, through some young trees it struck, and plashing among bedded pebbles stuck in the middle of a brook, whose silver ramble, down twenty little falls, through reeds and bramble, tracing along it brought me to a cave, whence it ran brightly forth, and white did lave the nether sides of mossy stones and rock, among which it gurgled blithe adieus to mock its own sweet grief at parting. Overhead hung a lush scene of drooping weeds, and spread thick as to curtain up some wood nymph's home. Ah, impious mortal, whither do I roam? said I low-voiced. Ah, whither? Tis the grot of Proserpine, when hell obscure and hot doth her resign, and where her tender hands she dabbles on the cool and sluicy sands. Or tis the cell of Echo, where she sits and babbles thorough silence till her wits are gone in tender madness and anon faints into sleep with many a dying tone of sadness. Oh, that she would take my vows and breathe them sighingly among the boughs to sue her gentle ears for whose fair head daily I pluck sweet flowerets from their bed and weave them dyingly, send honey whispers round every leaf that all those gentle lispers may sigh my love unto her pitying. O charitable echo, hear and sing this ditty to her, tell her. So I stayed, my foolish tongue, and listening, half afraid, stood stupefied with my own empty folly, and blushing for the freaks of melancholy. Salt tears were coming when I heard my name most fondly lipped, and then these accents came. Endymion, the cave is secreter than the isle of Delos. Echo hence shall stir no sighs but sigh warm kisses, or light noise of thy combing hand, the while it travelling cloys and trembles through my labyrinthine hair. At that oppressed I hurried in. Ah, uh, where are those swift moments? Whither are they fled? I'll smile no more, Piona nor will wed sorrow the way to death, but patiently bear up against it. So farewell, sad sigh, and come instead demurest meditation, to occupy me wholly, and to fashion my pilgrimage for the world's dusky brink. No more will I count over, link by link, my chain of grief, no longer strive to find a half-forgetfulness in mountain wind blustering about my ears, I thou shalt see, dearest of sisters, what my life shall be. What a calm round of hours shall make my days. There is a paly flame of hope that plays where'er I look, but yet I'll say tis not, and here I bid it die. Have not I caught already a more healthy countenance? By this the sun is setting. We may chance meet some of our near dwellers with my car. 
This said, he rose. Faint smelling like a star through autumn mists and took Piona's hand. They stepped into the boat and launched from land. End of section four. Read by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa, in November of 2022. Section 5 of Endymion. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Endymion by John Keats. Book 2, lines 1 through 219. O sovereign power of love, O grief, O balm, All records saving thine come cool and calm And shadowy through the mist of passed years. For others, good or bad, hatred and tears have become indolent, but touching thine one sigh doth echo, one poor sob doth pine, one kiss brings honeydew from buried days. The woes of Troy, towers smothering o'er their blaze, stiff holden shields, far piercing spears, keen blades, struggling and blood and shrieks, all dimly fades into some backward corner of the brain. Yet in our very souls we feel amain the close of Troilus and Cressid sweet. Hence pageant history, hence gilded cheat, swart planet in the universe of deeds, wide sea that one continuous murmur breeds along the pebbled shore of memory. Many old rotten timbered boats there be upon thy vaporous bosom, magnified to goodly vessels, many a sail of pride, and golden keeled, is left unlaunched and dry. But wherefore this? What care though out it fly about the great Athenian admiral's mast? What care though striding Alexander passed the Indus with his Macedonian numbers? Though old Ulysses tortured from his slumbers the glutted Cyclops? What care? Juliet leaning amid her window flowers, sighing, weaning tenderly her fancy from his maiden snow, doth more avail than these. The silver flow of hero's tears, the swoon of Imogen, fair Pastorella in the bandit's den, are things to brood on with more ardency than the death day of empires. Fearfully must such conviction come upon his head, who thus far discontent has dared to tread, without one use his smile or kind behest, the path of love and poesy. But rest in chafing restlessness is yet more drear than to be crushed in striving to uprear love's standards on the battlements of song. So once more days and nights aid me along, like legion soldiers. Brain-sick shepherd prince, what promise hast thou faithful guarded since the day of sacrifice? Or have new sorrows come with the constant dawn upon thy morrows? Alas, tis his old grief. For many days has he been wandering in uncertain ways, through wilderness and woods of mossed oaks, counting his woe-worn minutes by the strokes of the lone woodcutter, and listening still, hour after hour, to each lush-leaved rill. Now he is sitting by a shady spring, and elbow-deep with feverous fingering stems the outbursting cold. A wild rose-tree pavilions him in bloom, and he doth see a bud which snares his fancy. Lo! But now he plucks it, dips its stalk in the water, how? It swells, it buds, it flowers beneath his sight. And in the middle there is softly piped a golden butterfly, upon whose wings there must be surely charactered strange things, for with wide eye he wanders and smiles oft. Lightly this little herald flew aloft, followed by glad Endymion's clasped hands. Onward it flies, from Langer's sullen bands, his limbs are loosed, and eager on he hies, dazzled to trace it in the sunny skies. It seemed he flew the way so easy was, and like a newborn spirit did he pass through the green evening quiet in the sun, o'er many a heath, through many a woodland dun, through buried paths where sleepy twilight dreams the summer time away. One track unseems a wooded cleft, and far away the blue of ocean fades upon him. Then anew he sinks adown a solitary glen, where there was never sound of mortal men, saving perhaps some snow-like cadences melting to silence, when upon the breeze some holy bark led forth an anthem sweet to cheer itself to Delphi. Still his feet went swift beneath the merry-winged guide, until it reached a splashing fountain side that near a cavern's mouth for ever poured into the temperate air. Then high it soared, and downward suddenly began to dip, as if a thirst with so much toil twould sip the crystal spout head. So it did with touch most delicate, as though afraid to smutch even with mealy gold the waters clear. But at that very touch, to disappear so fairly quick was strange. Bewildered, Endymion sought around, and shook each bed of covert flowers in vain, and then he flung himself along the grass. What gentle tongue, what whisperer disturbed his gloomy rest? It was a nymph uprisen to the breast in the fountain's pebbly margin, and she stood among lilies, like the youngest of the brood. To him her dripping hand she softly kissed, and anxiously began to plait and twist her ringlets round her fingers, saying, Youth, too long, alas, hast thou starved on the ruth, the bitterness of love too long indeed, seeing thou art so gentle. Could I weed thy soul of care, by heavens I would offer all the bright riches of my crystal coffer to Amphitrite, or my clear-eyed fish, golden or rainbow-sided, or purplish, vermilion-tailed, or finned with silvery gauze, yea, or my veined pebble-floor that draws a virgin light to the deep. 
My grotto sands, tawny and gold, oozed slowly from far lands by my diligent springs, my little lilies, shells, my charming rod, my potent river spells, yes, everything, even to the pearly cup meander gave me, for I bubbled up to fainting creatures in a desert wild. But woe is me, I am but as a child to gladden thee, and all I dare to say is that I pity thee, that on this day I have been thy guide, that thou must wander far in other regions, past the scanty bar to mortal steps, before thou canst be tamed from every wasting sigh, from every pain, into the gentle bosom of thy love. Why it is thus, one knows, in heaven above, but a poor naiad, I guess not. Farewell, I have a ditty for my hollow cell. Hereat she vanished from Endymion's gaze, who brooded o'er the waters in a maze. The dashing font poured on, and where its pool lay, half asleep in grass and rushes cool, quick waterflies and gnats were sporting still, and fish were dimpling as if good nor ill had fallen out that hour. The wanderer, holding his forehead to keep off the burr of smothering fancies, patiently sat down, and while beneath the evening's sleepy frown glowworms began to trim their starry lamps, thus breathed he to himself. Whoso encamps to take a fancied city of delight, oh, what a wretch is he! And when tis his, after long toil and travelling, to miss the kernel of his hopes, how more than vile! Yet for him there's refreshment even in toil. Another city doth he set about, free from the smallest pebble-head of doubt that he will seize on trickling honeycombs. Alas, he finds them dry, and then he foams, and onward to another city speeds. But this is human life, the war, the deeds, the disappointment, the anxiety, the imagination, struggles, far and nigh, all human, bearing in themselves this good, that they are still the air, the subtle food, to make us feel existence, and to show how quiet death is. Where soil is, men grow, whether to weeds or flowers, but for me there is no depth to strike in. I can see naught earthly worth my compassing, so stand upon a misty jutting head of land. Alone? No, no. And by the Orphean lute, when mad Eurydice is listening to it, I'd rather stand upon this misty peak with not a thing to sigh for, or to seek, but the soft shadow of my thrice-seen love, than be, I care not what. O meek is dove of heaven, O Cynthia, ten times bright and fair, from thy blue throne, now filling all the air, glance but one little beam of tempered light into my bosom, that the dreadful might and tyranny of love be somewhat scared. Yet do not so, sweet queen. One torment spared would give a pang to jealous misery worse than the torment's self, but rather tie large wings upon my shoulders, and point out my love's far dwelling. Though the playful rout of Cupid shun thee, too divine art thou, too keen in beauty for thy silver prow, not to have dipped in love's most gentle stream. O oh, be propitious, nor severely deem my mantis impious, for by all the stars that tend thy bidding I do think the bars that kept my spirit in a burst, that I am sailing with thee through the dizzy sky. How beautiful thou art, the world how deep, how tremulous, dazzlingly the wheels sweep around their axle, then these gleaming reins, how lithe, when this thy chariot attains its early goal, haply some bow avails those twilight eyes, those eyes, my spirit fails, dear goddess, help, or the wide gaping air will gulf me. Help. At this, with maddened stare and lifted hands and trembling lips, he stood like old Deucalion mountained o'er the flood, or blind Orion hungry for the morn. And, but from the deep cavern, there was born a voice he had been froze to sense the stone, nor sigh of his, nor plaint, nor passionate moan, had more been heard. Thus swelled it forth. Descend, young mountaineer, descend, where alleys bend into the sparry hollows of the world. Oft hast thou seen bolts of the thunder hurled as from thy threshold, day by day hast been a little lower than the chilly sheen of icy pinnacles, and dipst thine arms into the deadening ether that still charms their marble being, now as deep profound as those are high, descend. He ne'er is crowned with immortality, who fears to follow where every voices lead, so through the hollow the silent mysteries of earth, descend. He heard but the last words, nor could contend, one moment in reflection, for he fled into the fearful deep, to hide his head from the clear moon, the trees, and coming madness. End of section 5。section 6 of Endymion。this librivox recording is in the public domain。read by Adrian Stevens。Endymion by John Keats。Book 2, lines 220 to 428. T'was far too strange and wonderful for sadness, sharpening by degrees his appetite to dive into the deepest. Dark nor light, the region nor bright, nor sombre holy, but mingled up, a gleaming melancholy, a dusky empire and its diadems, one faint eternal eventide of gems.
I, millions sparked on a vein of gold, along whose track the prince quick footsteps told, with all its lines abrupt and angular, out shooting sometimes like a meteor star, through the vast entry, then the metal woof, like Vulcan's rainbow with some monstrous roof, curves hugely, now far in the deep abyss, it seems an angry lightning, and doth hiss fancy into belief. Anon it leads through winding passages, where sameness breeds vexing conceptions of some sudden change, whether to silver grots or giant range of sapphire columns or fantastic bridge, athwart a flood of crystal. On a ridge now fareth he, that o'er the vast beneath towers like an ocean cliff, and whence he seeth a hundred waterfalls, whose voices come but as the murmuring surge, chilly and numb his bosom grew. Then first he, far away, decried an orbed diamond, set to fray old darkness from his throne. Twas like the sun, uprisen o'er chaos, and with such a stun came the amazement that absorbed in it he saw not fiercer wonders past the wit of any spirit to tell, but one of those who, when this planet's sphering time doth close, will be its high remembrances. Who, they, the mighty ones who have made eternal day for Greece and England, while astonishment with deep-drawn sighs was quieting, he went into a marble gallery, passing through a mimic temple so complete and true in sacred custom that he well-nigh feared to search it inwards, whence far off appeared through a long-pillared vista a fair shrine, and just beyond, on light tiptoe divine, a quivered Diane, stepping awfully, the youth approached, oft turning his veiled eye down sidelong aisles and into niches old, and when, more near against the marble cold, he had touched his forehead, he began to thread all courts and passages where silence dead, roused by his whispering footsteps, murmured faint, and long he traversed to and fro to acquaint himself with every mystery and awe, till, weary, he sat down before the moor of a wide outlet, fathomless and dim, to wild uncertainty and shadows grim. There, when new wonders ceased to float before, and thoughts of self came on, how crude and sore the journey homeward, to habitual self, a mad pursuing of the fog-born elf, whose flitting lantern through rude nettle briar cheats us into a swamp, into a fire, into the bosom of a hated thing. What misery most drowningly doth sing in lone endymion's ear, now he has caught the goal of consciousness? Ah, tis the thought the deadly feel of solitude, for, lo, he cannot see the heavens, nor the flow of rivers, nor hill-flowers running wild in pink and purple checker, nor up-piled the cloudy rack slow journeying in the west like herded elephants, nor felt, nor pressed cool grass, nor tasted the fresh slumbrous air. But, far from such companionship to wear an unknown time, surcharged with grief away, was now his lot. And must he patience stay, tracing fantastic figures with his spear? No, exclaimed he, why should I tarry here? No, loudly echoed times innumerable, at which he straightway started, and gan tell his paces, back into the temple's chief, warming and growing strong in the belief of help from Diane, so that when, again, he caught her airy form, thus 
did he plain, moving more near the while. O oh, haunter chaste, of river sides and woods and heathy waste, where with thy silver bow and arrows keen art thou now forested? O oh, woodland queen, what smoothest e'er thy smoother forehead woos? Where dost thou listen to the wide halloes of thy departed nymphs? Through what dark tree glimmers thy crescent? Wheresoe'er it be, tis in the breath of heaven, thou dost taste freedom as none can taste it, nor dost waste thy loveliness in dismal elements, but finding in our green earth sweet contents, where livest blissfully, ah, if to thee it feels Elysian, how rich to me an exiled mortal sounds its pleasant name, within my breast there lives a choking flame. Oh, let me call it among the zephyr boughs, a homeward fever parches up my tongue. Oh, let me slake it at the running springs, upon my car a noisy nothing rings. Oh, let me once more hear the linnet's note, before mine eyes thick films and shadows float. Oh, let me anoint them with the heaven's light. Dost thou now lave thy feet and ankles white? Oh, think how sweet to me the freshening sluice. Dost thou now please thy thirst with berry juice? Oh, think how this dry palate would rejoice if in soft slumber thou didst hear my voice. Oh, think how I should love a bed of flowers. Young goddess, let me see my native bowers. Deliver me from this rapacious deep. Thus ending loudly, as he would o'erleap his destiny, alert he stood. But when obstinate silence came heavily again, feeling about for its old couch of space, and airy cradle lowly bowed his face, desponding o'er the marble floor's cold thrill. But t'was not long, for sweeter than the rill to its old channel, or a swollen tide to margin sallows, were the leaves he spied, and flowers, and wreaths, and ready myrtle crowns, up heaping through the slab, refreshment drowns itself, and strives its own delights to hide, nor in one spot alone the floral pride, in a long whispering birth enchanted grew, before his footsteps, as when heaved anew, old ocean rolls a lengthened wave to the shore, down whose green back the short-lived foam all hoar bursts gradual with a wayward indolence. Increasing still in heart and pleasant sense, upon his fairy journey on he hastes, so anxious for the end, he scarcely wastes one moment with his hand among the sweets. Onward he goes, he stops, his bosom beats as plainly in his ear as the faint charm of which the throbs were born. This still alarm, this sleepy music, forced him walk tiptoe, for it came more softly than the east could blow Arion's magic to the Atlantic Isles, or than the west, made jealous by the smiles of throned Apollo, could breathe back the lyre to seize Ionian and Tyrian. O oh, did he ever live, that lonely man, who loved and music slew not? Tis the pest of love that fairest joys give most unrest, that things of delicate and tenderest worth are swallowed all and made a seared death by one consuming flame. It doth immerse and suffocate true blessings in a curse. Half happy, by comparison of bliss, is miserable. T'was even so with this dew-dropping melody in the carrion's ear. First heaven, then hell, and then forgotten clear, vanished in elemental passion. 
and down some swart abysm he had gone, had not a heavenly guide benignant led to where thick myrtle branches gainst his head, brushing, awakened, then the sounds again went noiseless as a passing noontide rain, over a bower where little space he stood, for as the sunset peeps into a wood, so saw he panting light, and towards it went, through winding alleys and low wonderment. Upon soft verdure saw one here, one there, cupids a-slumbering on their pinions fair. After a thousand mazes overgone, at last with sudden step, he came upon a chamber, myrtle-walled, embowered high, full of light, incense, tender minstrelsy, and more of beautiful and strange beside. For on a silken couch of rosy pride, in midst of all, there lay a sleeping youth, of fondest beauty, fonder in fair sooth, than sighs could fathom or contentment reach and coverlids gold-tinted like the peach, or ripe October's faded marigolds, fell sleek about him in a thousand folds, not hiding up an Apollonian curve of neck and shoulder, nor the tenting swerve of knee from knee, nor ankles pointing light, but rather giving them to the filled sight officiously. Sideway, his face reposed by one white arm, and tenderly unclosed by tenderest pressure, a faint damask mouth to slumbery pout, just as the morning south disparts a dew-lipped rose. Above his head four lily-stalks did their white honours wed to make a coronal, and round him grew all tendrils green, of every bloom and hue, together intertwined and trammelled fresh, the vine of glossy sprout, the ivy mesh, shading its Ethiop berries and woodbine, of velvet leaves and bugle blooms divine. Convolvulus in streaked vases flush, the creeper mellowing for an autumn blush, and virgin's bower trailing airily, with others of the sisterhood. Hard by stood serene cupids watching silently. One, kneeling to a lyre, touched the strings, muffling to death the pathos with his wings, and, ever and anon, uprose to look at the youth's slumber, while another took a willow bough, distilling odorous dew, and shook it on his hair, Another flew in through the woven roof, and fluttering wise rained violets upon his sleeping eyes. End of section six. Section seven of Endymion. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Stevens. Endymion by John Keats. Book two. Lines 429 to 650. At these enchantments, and yet many more, the breathless Latmian wandered o'er and o'er, until, impatient in embarrassment, he forthright passed, and lightly treading went to that same feathered lyrist, who straightway, smiling, thus whispered, Though from upper day thou art a wanderer, and thy presence here might seem unholy, be of happy cheer, for tis the nicest touch of human honour when some ethereal and high-favouring donor presents immortal bowers to mortal sense, and now tis done to thee, Endymion. Hence was I in no wise startled, so recline upon these living flowers, here is wine, alive with sparkles, never, I aver, since Ariadne was a vintager, so cool a purple, taste these juicy pears, sent me by sad Vertumnus, when his fears were high about Pomona, here is cream, deepening to richness from a snowy gleam, sweeter than that nurse Amalthea skimmed for the boy Jupiter, 
and here, undimmed by any touch, a bunch of blooming plums, ready to melt between an infant's gums, and here is manna picked from Syrian trees, in starlight by the three Hesperides. Feast on, and meanwhile I will let thee know of all these things around us. He did so, still brooding o'er the cadence of his lyre, and thus, I need not any hearing tire by telling how the sea-born goddess pined for a mortal youth, and how she strove to bind him all in all unto her doting self. Who would not be so prisoned? But, fond elf, he was content to let her amorous plea faint through his careless arms, content to see an unseized heaven dying at his feet. Content, O oh, fool, to make a cold retreat, when on the pleasant grass such love, love-lorn, lay sorrowing, when every tear was born of diverse passion, when her lips and eyes were closed in sullen moisture, and quick sighs came vexed and pettish through her nostrils small. Hush, no exclaim yet! Justly mightst thou call curses upon his head. I was half glad, but my poor mistress went distract and mad. When the boar tusked him, so away she flew to Jove's high throne, and by her planings drew immortal teardrops down the thunderer's beard, whereon it was decreed he should be reared each summer time to life. Lo, this is he, that same Adonis, safe in the privacy of this still region all his winter sleep. I sleep for when our lovesick queen did weep o'er his waned course, the tremulous shower healed up the wound, and with a balmy power medicined death to a lengthened drowsiness, the which she fills with visions, and doth dress in all this quiet luxury, and hath set us young immortals without any let to watch his slumber through. Tis well nigh past, even to a moment's filling up, and fast she scuds with summer breeze to pant through the first long kiss, warm firstling, to renew embowered sports in Cytheria's isle. Look how those winged listeners all this while stand anxious, see, behold, this claimant word broke through the careful silence, for they heard a rustling noise of leaves, and out of there fluttered pigeons and doves. Adonis something muttered, the while one hand that erst upon his thigh lay dormant, moved, convulsed, and gradually up to his forehead. Then there was a hum of sudden voices echoing, Come, come, arise, awake, Clear summer has forth walked unto the clover sward, and she has talked full soothingly to every nested finch. Rise, cupids, or will give the bluebell pinch to your dimpled arms. Once more, sweet life, begin. At this, from every side they hurried in, rubbing their sleepy eyes with lazy wrists, and doubling overhead their little fists in backward yawns, but all were soon alive, for as delicious wine doth, sparkling, dive in nectared clouds and curls through water fair, so from the arbor roof down swelled an air odorous and enlivening, making all to laugh and play and sing, and loudly call for their sweet queen, when, lo, the wreathed green disparted, and far upward could be seen blue heaven and a silver car airborne, whose silent wheels, fresh wet from clouds of morn, spun off a drizzling dew, which, falling chill on soft Adonis's shoulders, made him still nestle and turn uneasily about. Soon were the white doves plain with necks stretched out, and silken traces lightened in descent, and soon, returning from love's banishment, Queen Venus, leaning downward open-armed, 
her shadow fell upon his breast, and charmed a tumult to his heart, and a new life into his eyes. Ah, miserable strife, but for her comforting, unhappy sight, but meeting her blue orbs. Who, who can write of these first minutes, the uncharriest muse to embracements warm, as theirs makes coy excuse? Oh, it has ruffled every spirit there, saving love's self, who stands superb to share the general gladness, awfully he stands, a sovereign quell is in his waving hands, no sight can bear the lightning of his bow, his quiver is mysterious, none can know what themselves think of it, from forth his eyes there darts strange light of varied hues and dyes, a scowl is sometime on his brow, but who look full upon it feel anon the blue of his fair eyes run liquid through their souls. Endymion feels it, and no more controls the burning prayer within him. So, bent low, he had begun a plaining of his woe. But Venus, bending forward, said, My child, favour this gentle youth. His days are wild with love. He... But, alas, too well, I see thou knowest the deepness of his misery. Ah, smile not so, my son, I tell thee true, that when through heavy hours I used to rue the endless sleep of this new-born Adon, this stranger I I pitied, for upon a dreary morning once I fled away into the breezy clouds to weep and pray for this my love, for vexing Mars had teased me even to tears. Thence, when a little eased, down-looking, vacant through a hazy wood, I saw this youth as he despairing stood, those same dark curls blown vagrant in the wind, those same full-fringed lids a constant blind over his sullen eyes. I saw him throw himself on withered leaves, even as though death had come sudden, for no jot he moved, yet muttered wildly. I could hear he loved some fair immortal, and that his embrace had zoned her through the night. There is no trace of this in heaven. I have marked each cheek, and find it is the vainest thing to seek and that of all things tis kept secretest, Endymion, one day thou wilt be blessed. So still obey the guiding hand that fends thee safely through these wonders for sweet ends. Tis a concealment needful in extreme, and if I guessed not so, the sunny beam thou shouldst mount up to with me. Now, adieu, here must we leave thee, at these words, up flew the impatient doves, up rose the floating car, up went the hum celestial, high afar, the Latmians saw them minish into naught, and, when all were clear vanished, still he caught a vivid lightning from that dreadful bow, when all was darkened with Etnian throe, the earth closed gave a solitary moan, and left him once again in twilight lone. He did not rave, he did not stare aghast, for all those visions were o'ergone and past, and he, in loneliness, he felt assured of happy times when all he had endured would seem a feather to the mighty prize. So, with unusual gladness, on he hies through caves and palaces of mottled ore, gold dome and crystal wall, and turquoise floor, black polished porticoes of awful shade, and, at last, a diamond balustrade, leading afar past wild magnificence, spiral through ruggedest loopholes, and thence, stretching across a void, then guiding o'er enormous chasms, where, all foam and roar, Streams subterranean tease their granite beds, then, heightened just above the silvery heads of a thousand fountains, 
so that he could dash the waters with his spear. But at the splash, done heedlessly, those spouting columns rose, sudden a poplar's height, and gan to enclose his diamond path with fretwork, streaming round, alive and dazzling cool, and with a sound, haply like dolphin tumults, when sweet shells welcome the float of Thetis, long he dwells on this delight. For every minute's space the streams with changed magic interlace, sometimes like delicatest lattices covered with crystal vines, then weeping trees moving about as in a gentle wind, which in a wink to watery gauze refined, poured into shapes of curtained canopies, spangled and rich with liquid broideries of flowers, peacocks, swans and naiads fair, swifter than lightning went these wonders rare, and then the water, into stubborn streams collecting, mimicked the wrought oaken beams, pillars and frieze, and high fantastic roof of those dusk places in times far aloof, cathedrals called. He bade a loath farewell to these founts protean, passing gulf and dell and torrent and ten thousand jutting shapes, half seen through deepest gloom and grisly gapes, blackening on every side and overhead, a vaulted dome like heavens, far bespread, with starlight gems, I, all so huge and strange, the solitary felt a hurried change, working within him into something dreary, vexed like a morning eagle, lost and weary, and purblind amid foggy midnight wolds, but he revives at once, for who beholds new sudden things, nor casts his mental slough, forth from a rugged arch in the dusk below, came Mother Sibylle, alone, alone, in sombre chariot, dark foldings thrown, about her majesty, and front death pale with turrets crowned, four-maned lions hail the sluggish wheels, solemn their toothed moors, their surly eyes brow-hidden, heavy paws uplifted drowsily, and nervy tails cowering their tawny brushes. Silent sails this shadowy queen athwart, and faints away in another gloomy arch. End of section 7《セクション8 of Endymion》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Endymion by John Keats, Book Two, Lines Six Fifty to Eight Two Nine. Wherefore delay, young traveller, in such a mournful place? Art thou wayworn, or canst not further trace the diamond path? and does it indeed end abrupt in middle air yet earthward bend thy forehead and to jupiter cloud-born call ardently he was indeed way-worn abrupt in middle air his way was lost to cloud-born jove he bowed and there crossed towards him a large eagle twixt whose wings without one impious word himself he flings committed to the darkness and the gloom down down uncertain to what pleasant doom swift as a fathoming plummet down he fell through unknown things to exhaled asphodel and rose with spicy fannings interbreathed comes swelling forth where little caves were wreathed so thick with leaves and mosses that they seemed large honeycombs of green and freshly teemed with airs delicious in the greenest nook the eagle landed him and farewell took it was a jasmine bower all bestrown with golden moss his every sense had grown ethereal for pleasure above his head flew a delight half graspable his tread was hesperian 
to his capable ears silence was music from the holy spheres a dewy luxury was in his eyes the little flowers felt his pleasant sighs and stirred them faintly verdant cave and cell he wandered through oft wondering at such swell of sudden exultation but alas said he will all this gush of feeling pass away in solitude and must they wane like melodies upon a sandy plain without an echo then shall i be left so sad so melancholy so bereft yet still i feel immortal o oh, my love my breath of life where art thou high above dancing before the morning gates of heaven or keeping watch among those starry seven old atlas children art a maid of the waters one of shell-winding triton's bright-haired daughters or art impossible a nymph of diane's weaving a coronal of tender scions for very idleness where'er thou art methinks it now is at my will to start into thine arms to scare aurora's train and snatch thee from the morning o'er the main to scud like a wild bird and take thee off from thy sea foamy cradle or to doff thy shepherd vest and woo thee mid fresh leaves no no too eagerly my soul deceives its perilous self i know this cannot be o oh, let me then by some sweet dreaming flee to her entrancements hither sleep a while hither most gentle sleep and soothing foil for some few hours the coming solitude thus spake he and that moment felt endued with power to dream deliciously so wound through a dim passage searching till he found the smoothest mossy bed and deepest where he threw himself and just into the air stretching his indolent arms he took o oh bliss a naked waist fair cupid whence is this a well-known voice sighed sweetest here am i at which soft ravishment with doting cry they trembled to each other helicon o oh, fountain hill o oh, homer's helicon that thou would spout a little streamlet o'er these sorry pages then the verse would soar and sing above this gentle pair like lark over his nested young but all is dark around thine aged top and thy clear fount exhales in mist to heaven ay the count of mighty poets is made up the scroll is folded by the muses the bright roll is in apollo's hand our dazed eyes have seen a new tinge in the western skies the world has done its duty yet o oh yet although the sun of poesy is set these lovers did embrace and we must weep that there is no old power left to steep a quill immortal in their joyous tears long time in silence did their anxious fears question that thus it was long time they lay fondling and kissing every doubt away long time ere soft caressing sobs began to mellow into words and then there ran two bubbling springs of talk from their sweet lips o oh, known unknown from whom my being sips such darling essence wherefore may i not be ever in these arms in this sweet spot pillow my chin for ever ever press these toying hands and kiss their smooth excess why not for ever and for ever feel that breath about my eyes ah thou wilt steal away from me again indeed indeed thou wilt be gone away and wilt not heed my lonely madness speak my kindest fair 
is is it to be so no who will dare to pluck thee from me and of thine own will full well i feel thou wouldst not leave me still let me entwine thee surer surer now how can we part elysium who art thou who that thou canst not be for ever here or lift me with thee to some starry sphere enchantress tell me by this soft embrace by the most soft completion of thy face those lips o oh slippery blisses twinkling eyes and by these tenderest milky sovereignties these tenderest and by the nectar wine the passion o oh, loved ida the divine endymion dearest ah unhappy me his soul will scape us o oh, felicity how he does love me his poor temples beat to the very tune of love how sweet 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 revive dear youth or i shall faint and die revive or these soft hours will hurry by in trancid dullness speak and let that spell affright this lethargy i cannot quell its heavy pressure and will press at least my lips to thine that they may richly feast until we taste the life of love again what dost thou move dost kiss o bliss o pain i love thee youth more than i can conceive and so long absence from thee doth bereave my soul of any rest yet must i hence yet can i not to starry eminence uplift thee nor for very shame can own myself to thee ah dearest do not groan or thou wilt force me from this secrecy and i must blush in heaven oh that i had done it already that the dreadful smiles at my lost brightness my impassioned wiles had waned from olympus solemn height and from all serious gods that our delight was quite forgotten save of us alone and wherefore so ashamed tis but to atone for endless pleasure by some coward blushes yet must i be a coward honour rushes too palpable before me the sad look of jove minerva's start no bosom shook with awe of purity no cupid pinion in reverence veiled my crystalline dominion half lost and all old hymns made nullity but what is this to love oh i could fly with thee into the ken of heavenly powers so thou wouldst thus for many sequent hours press me so sweetly now i swear at once that i am wise that pallas is a dunce perhaps her love like mine is but unknown oh i do think that i have been alone in chastity yes pallas has been sighing while every eye saw me my hair up tying with fingers cool as aspen leaves sweet love i was as vague as solitary dove nor knew that nests were built now a soft kiss i by that kiss i vow an endless bliss an immortality of passions thine ere long i will exalt thee to the shine of heaven ambrosial and we will shade ourselves whole summers by a river glade and i will tell thee stories of the sky and breathe thee whispers of its minstrelsy my happy love will overwing all bounds oh let me melt into thee let the sounds of our close voices marry at their birth let us entwine hoveringly o oh, dearth of human words roughness of mortal speech lispings imperion will i sometime teach thine honeyed tongue lute breathing which i gasp to have thee understand now while i clasp thee thus and weep for fondness 
i am pained endymion woe woe is grief contained in the very deeps of pleasure my sole life hereat with many sobs her gentle strife melted into a languor he returned entranced bows and tears end of section eight read by alan mapstone Section 9 of Endymion. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Stevens. Endymion by John Keats. Book 2, lines 830 to 1026. Ye who have yearned with too much passion will here stay and pity for the mere sake of truth, as tis a ditty not of these days but long ago twas told by cavern wind unto a forest old and then the forest told it in a dream to a sleeping lake whose cool and level gleam a poet caught as he was journeying to phoebus shrine and in it he did fling his weary limbs bathing an hour's space and after straight in that inspired place he sang the story up into the air, giving it universal freedom. There has it been ever, sounding for those ears whose tips are glowing hot. The legend cheers yon sentinel stars, and he who listens to it must surely be self-doomed, or he will rue it. For quenchless burnings come upon the heart, made fiercer by a fear, lest any part should be engulfed in the eddying wind. As much as here is penned doth always find a resting place. Thus much comes clear and plain, anon the strange voice is upon the wane, and tis but echoed from departing sound that the fair visitant at last unwound her gentle limbs and left the youth asleep. Thus the tradition of the gusty deep. Now turn we to our former chroniclers. Endymion awoke, that grief of hers sweet paining on his ear. He sickly guessed how lone he was once more, and sadly pressed his empty arms together, hung his head, and most forlorn upon that widowed bed, sat silently. Love's madness he had known, often with more than tortured lion's groan, moanings had burst from him, but now that rage had passed away. No longer did he wage a rough-voiced war against the dooming stars. No, he had felt too much for such harsh jars, the lyre of his soul Aeolian tuned, forgot all violence, and but communed with melancholy thought. Oh, he had swooned drunken from pleasure's nipple, and his love henceforth was dove-like. Loath was he to move from the imprinted couch, and when he did, twas with slow, languid paces, and face hid in muffling hands. So tempered out he strayed, half-seeing visions, that might have dismayed Alecto's serpents, ravishments more keen than Hermes' pipe, when anxious he did lean over eclipsing eyes, and at the last it was a sounding grotto, vaulted, vast, or studded with a thousand, thousand pearls, and crimson-mouthed shells with stubborn curls of every shape and size, even to the bulk in which whales arbor close to brood and sulk against an endless storm. Moreover, too, fish semblances of green and azure hue, ready to snort their streams, in this cool wonder Endymion sat down and gan to ponder on all his life, his youth, up to the day when mid acclaim and feasts and garlands gay he stepped upon his shepherd throne, the look of his white palace in the wild forest nook, and all the revels he had lauded there, 
each tender maiden whom he once thought fair with every friend and fellow woodlander passed like a dream before him then the spur of the old bards to mighty deeds his plans to nurse the golden age mong shepherd clans that wondrous night the great pan festival his sister's sorrow and his wanderings all until the earth's deep moor he rushed then all its buried magic till it flushed high with excessive love and now thought he how long must i remain in jeopardy of blank amazements that amaze no more now i have tasted her sweet soul to the core all other depths are shallow essences once spiritual are like muddy lees meant but to fertilize my earthly root and make my branches lift a golden fruit into the bloom of heaven other light though it be quick and sharp enough to blight the olympian eagle's vision is dark dark as the parentage of chaos hark my silent thoughts are echoing from these shells or they are but the ghosts the dying swells of noises far away list hereupon he kept an anxious ear the humming tone came louder and behold there as he lay on either side out gushed with misty spray a copious spring and both together dashed swift mad fantastic round the rocks and lashed among the conches and shells of the lofty grot leaving a trickling dew at last they shot down from the ceiling's height pouring a noise as of some breathless racers whose hopes poise upon the last few steps and with spent force along the ground they took a winding course endymion followed for it seemed that one ever pursued the other strove to shun followed their languid mazes till well nigh he had left thinking of the mystery and was now wrapped in tender hoverings over the vanished bliss ah what is it sings his dream away what melodies are these they sound as through the whispering of trees not native in such barren vaults give ear o oh, arethusa peerless nymph why fear such tenderness as mine great diane why why didst thou hear her prayer oh that i were rippling round her dainty fairness now circling about her waist and striving how to entice her to a dive then stealing in between her luscious lips and eyelids thin oh that her shining hair was in the sun and i distilling from it thence to run in amorous rillets down her shrinking form to linger on her lily shoulders warm between her kissing breasts and every charm touch raptured see how painfully i flow fair maid be pitiful to my great woe stay stay thy weary course and let me lead a happy wooer to the flowery mead where all that beauty snared me cruel god desist or my offended mistress's nod will stagnate all thy fountains tease me not with siren words ah have i really got such power to madden thee and is it true away away or i shall dearly rue my very thoughts in mercy then away kindest alpheus for should i obey my own dear will twould be a deadly bane o oh, o oh red queen would that thou hadst a pain like this of mine then would i fearless turn and be a criminal alas i burn i shudder gentle river get thee hence alpheus thou enchanter every sense of mine was once made perfect in these woods fresh breezes bowery lawns and innocent floods ripe fruits and lonely couch contentment gave but ever since i heedlessly did lave in thy deceitful stream a panting glow grew strong within me wherefore serve me so and call it love alas twas cruelty 
Not once more did I close my happy eyes amid the thrush's song. Away, avaunt, oh, t'was a cruel thing. Now thou dost taunt so softly, Arethusa, that I think if thou wast playing on my shady brink, thou wouldst bathe once again. Innocent maid, stifle thine heart no more, nor be afraid of angry powers. There are deities will shade us with their wings. Those fitful sighs, tis almost death to hear. Oh, let me pour a dewy balm upon them. Fear no more, sweet Arethusa. Diane's self must feel sometimes these very pangs. Dear maiden, steal blushing into my soul, and let us fly these dreary caverns for the open sky. I will delight thee all my winding course, from the green sea up to my hidden source, about Arcadian forests, and will show the channels where my coolest waters flow, through mossy rocks where, mid exuberant green, I roam in pleasant darkness, more unseen than Saturn in his exile, where I brim round flowery islands, and take thence a skim of mealy sweets, which myriads of bees buzz from their honeyed wings, and thou shouldst please thyself to choose the richest, where we might be incense pillowed every summer night. Doff all sad fears, thou white deliciousness, and let us be thus comforted, unless thou couldst rejoice to see my hopeless stream hurry distracted from Sol's temperate beam, and pour to death among some hungry sands. What can I do, Alpheus? Diane stands severe before me, persecuting fate. Unhappy Arethusa, thou wast late a huntress free in. At this sudden fell those two sad streams adown a fearful dell. The Latmian listened, but he heard no more, save echo, faint repeating o'er and o'er the name of Arethusa. On the verge of that dark gulf he wept and said, I urge thee, gentle goddess of my pilgrimage, by our eternal hopes, to soothe, to assuage, if thou art powerful, these lovers' pains, and make them happy in some happy plains. He turned, there was a whelming sound, he stepped, there was a cooler light, and so he kept towards it by a sandy path, and lo, more suddenly than doth a moment go, the visions of the earth were gone and fled, he saw the giant sea above his head. End of section 9《ヴィンディミアン》。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Endymion by John Keats, Book Three, Lines One to Two Hundred Eighteen. There are who lord it o'er their fellow men with most prevailing tinsel, who unpen their bawing vanities to browse away the comfortable green and juicy hay from human pastures, or o、oh, torturing fact. Who through an idiot blink will see unpacked fire branded foxes to sear up and singe our gold and ripe eared hopes, with not one tinge of sanctuary splendor, not a sight able to face an owl's, they still are dight by the blear eyed nations in empurpled vests and crowns and turbans, with unladen breasts, save of blown self applause, they proudly mount to their spirit's perch. Their beings high account, their tip top nothings, their dull skies, their thrones, amid the fierce intoxicating tones of trumpets, shoutings, and belabored drums, and sudden cannon. All, how all this hums in wakeful ears, like uproar past and gone, like thunder clouds that spake to Babylon, and set those old Chaldeans to their tasks. Are then regalities all gilded masks? No, there are throned seats unscalable, but by a patient wing, a constant spell, 
or by ethereal things that unconfined can make a ladder of the eternal wind and poise about in cloudy thunder tents to watch the abysm birth of elements i above the withering of old-lipped fate a thousand powers keep religious state in water fiery realm and airy bourne and silent as a consecrated urn holds fiery sessions for a season due yet few of these far majesties ah few have bared their operations to this globe few who with gorgeous pageantry and robe our peace of heaven whose benevolence shakes hand with our own series, every sense filling with spiritual sweets to plenitude, as bees gorge full their cells, and by the feud twixt nothing and creation, I here swear, etern Apollo, that thy sister fair is of all these the gentlier mightiest. When thy gold breath is misting in the west, she unobserved steals unto her throne, and there she sits most meek and most alone, as if she had not pomp subservient, as if thine eye, high poet, was not bent towards her with the muses in thine heart, as if the ministering stars kept not apart, waiting for silver-footed messages. O moon, the oldest shades among oldest trees feel palpitations when thou lookest in. O moon, old boughs lisp forth a holier din, the while they feel thine airy fellowship. Thou dost bless everywhere, with silver lip, kissing dead things to life. The sleeping kine, couched in thy brightness, dream of fields divine. Innumerable mountains rise and rise, ambitious for the hallowing of thine eyes. And yet thy benediction passeth not, one obscure hiding place, one little spot, where pleasure may be sent. The nested wren has thy fair face within its tranquil ken, and from beneath a sheltering ivy leaf takes glimpses of thee. Thou art a relief to the poor patient oyster where it sleeps within its pearly house. The mighty deeps, the monstrous sea is thine, the myriad sea. O moon, Far spooming ocean bows to thee, and Tellus feels his forehead's cumbrous load. Cynthia, where art thou now? What far abode of green or silvery bower doth enshrine such utmost beauty? Alas, thou dost pine, for one is sorrowful. Thy cheek is pale, for one whose cheek is pale. Thou dost bewail his tears who weeps for thee. Where dost thou sigh? Ah, surely that light peeps from Vesper's eye, or what a thing is love? Tis she, but lo! How changed, how full of ache, how gone in woe! She dies at the thinnest cloud, her loveliness is wan on Neptune's blue. Yet there's a stress of love spangles just off yon cape of trees, dancing upon the waves as if to please the curly foam with amorous influence. O oh, not so idle, for down glancing thence she fathoms eddies and runs wild about o'erwhelming watercourses, scaring out the thorny sharks from hiding holes and frightening their savage eyes with unaccustomed lightning. Where will the splendor be content to reach? O oh, love, how potent hast thou been to teach strange journeyings wherever beauty dwells in gulf or airy, mountains or deep dells, in light, in gloom, in star or blazing sun, thou pointest out the way, and straight tis won. Amid his toil thou gavest Leander breath, thou leddest Orpheus through the gleams of death, thou madest Pluto bear thin element, and now, O winged chieftain, them hast sent a moonbeam to the deep, deep water world, to find endymion on gold sand impearled with lily shells and pebbles milky white poor cynthia greeted him and soothed her light against his pallid face he felt the charm to breathlessness and suddenly a warm of his heart's blood twas very sweet he stayed his wandering steps and half entranced laid his head upon a tuft of straggling weeds to taste the gentle moon and freshening beads, 
lashed from the crystal roof by fishes' tails. And so he kept until the rosy veils, mantling the east by Aurora's peering hand, were lifted from the water's breast and fond into sweet air, and sobered morning came meekly through billows, when, like taper flame left sudden by a dallying breath of air, he rose in silence and once more gan fare along his faded way. Far had he roamed, with nothing save the hollow vast that foamed above, around, and at his feet, save things more dead than Morpheus's imaginings. Old rusted anchors, helmets, breastplates large, of gone sea warriors, brazen beaks and targe, rudders that for a hundred years had lost the sway of human hand, gold vase embossed with long-forgotten story, and wherein no reveller had ever dipped a chin but those of Saturn's vintage, mouldering scrolls, writ in the tongue of heaven by those souls who first were on the earth and sculptures rude in ponderous stone, developing the mood of ancient knocks, then skeletons of man, of beast, behemoth, and leviathan, and elephant and eagle and huge jaw of nameless monster. A cold leaden awe these secrets struck into him, and unless Diane had chased away that heaviness, he might have died, but now, with cheered feel, he onward kept, wooing these thoughts to steal about the labyrinth in his soul of love. What is there in thee, moon, that thou shouldst move my heart so potently? When yet a child, I oft have dried my tears when thou hast smiled. Thou seemst my sister, hand in hand we went from eve to morn across the firmament. No apples would I gather from the tree, till thou hadst cooled their cheeks deliciously. No tumbling water ever spake romance, but when my eyes with thine thereon could dance. No woods were green enough, no bower divine, until thou liftedst up thine eyelids fine. In sowing time ne'er would I dibble take, or drop a seed till thou wast wide awake. And in the summer tide of blossoming, no one but thee hath heard me blithely sing, and mesh my dewy flowers all the night. No melody was like a passing sprite, if it went not to solemnize thy reign. Yes, in my boyhood every joy and pain by thee were fashioned to the self-same end, and as I grew in years still didst thou blend with all my ardours. Thou wast the deep glen, thou wast the mountain top, the sage's pen, the poet's harp, the voice of friends, the sun. Thou wast the river, thou wast glory one, thou wast my clarion's blast, thou wast my steed, my goblet full of wine, my topmost deed. Thou wast the charm of women, lovely moon. Oh, what a wild and harmonized tune my spirit struck from all the beautiful. On some bright essence could I lean, and lull myself to immortality, I pressed nature's soft pillow in a wakeful rest. But, gentle orb, there came a nearer bliss. My strange love came, felicity's abyss. She came, and thou didst fade and fade away. Yet not entirely, no, thy starry sway has been an underpassion to this hour. Now I begin to feel thine orby power is coming fresh upon me, Oh, be kind, keep back thine influence, and do not blind my sovereign vision. Dearest love, forgive that I can think away from thee and live. Pardon me, airy planet, that I prize one thought beyond thine argent luxuries. How far beyond? At this a surprised start frosted the springing verdure of his heart. For as he lifted up his eyes to swear how his own goddess was past all things fair, he saw far in the concave green of the sea an old man sitting calm and peacefully. Upon a weeded rock this old man sat, and his white hair was awful, and a mat of weeds were cold beneath his cold thin feet. And ample as the largest winding sheet, 
a cloak of blue wrapped up his aged bones, or wrought with symbols by the deepest groans of ambitious magic. Every ocean form was woven in with black distinctness. Storm and calm and whispering and hideous roar were emblemed in the woof, with every shape that skims or dives or sleeps twixt cape and cape. The gulfing whale was like a dot in the spell, yet look upon it and twould size and swell to its huge self, and the minutest fish would pass the very hardest gazer's wish and show his little eye's anatomy. Then there was pictured the regality of Neptune and the sea nymphs round his state in beauteous vassalage look up and wait. Beside this old man lay a pearly wand, and in his lap a book, the which he conned so steadfastly that the new denizen had time to keep him in amazed ken to mark these shadowings and stand in awe. End of section 10 Read by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa, in December of 2022. Section 11 of Endymion. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Endymion by John Keats. Book 3, lines 219 to 419. The old man raised his hoary head and saw the wildered stranger, seeming not to see his features were so lifeless. Suddenly he woke as from a trance, his snow-white brows went arching up, and like two magic ploughs furrowed deep wrinkles in his forehead large, which kept as fixedly as rocky marge, till round his withered lips had gone a smile. Then up he rose, like one whose tedious toil had watched for years in forlong hermitage, who had not from midlife to utmost age eased in one accent his o'erburdened soul, even to the trees. He rose. He grasped his stole with convulsed clenches waving it abroad, and in a voice of solemn joy, that awed echo into oblivion, he said, Thou art the man. Now shall I lay my head in peace upon my watery pillow. Now sleep will come smoothly to my weary brow. Oh, Jove, I shall be young again, be young O shell-born Neptune, I am pierced and stung with new-born life. What shall I do? Where go when I have cast this servant skin of woe? I'll swim to the sirens, and one moment listen their melodies, and see their long hair glisten. Anon upon that giant's arm I'll be that rise about the roots of Sicily. To northern seas I'll in a twinkle sail, And mount upon the snortings of a whale To some black cloud. Thence down I'll madly sweep on forked lightning To the deepest deep, Where through some sucking pool I will be hurled With rapture to the other side of the world. Ah, oh, I am full of gladness. Sisters three, I bow full-hearted to your old decree. Yes, Every god be thanked, and power benign, For I no more shall wither, droop, and pine. Thou art the man. And Divian started back dismayed, And like a wretch from whom the rack Tortures hot breath and speech of agony, Muttered, What lonely death am I to die In this cold region? Will he let me freeze and float my brittle limbs O'er polar seas? Or will he touch me with his searing hand, And leave a black memorial on the sand? Or tear me piecemeal with a bony saw, And keep me as a chosen food, To draw his magian fish through hated fire and flame? Oh, misery of hell! Resistless, tame! Am I to be burned up? No, I will shout until the gods through the heavens blue look out. Oh, Tartarus! But some few days agone her soft arms were entwining me, And on her voice I hung like fruit among green leaves. Her lips were all my own, and, ah, 
ripe sheaves of happiness. Ye on the stubble droop, but never may be guarded. I must stoop my head and kiss death's foot. Love, love, farewell. Is there no hope from thee? This horrid spell would melt thy sweet breath. By Dian's hind feeding from her white fingers, On the wind I see thy streaming hair. And now, by Pan, I care not for this old mysterious man. He spake, and walking to that aged form, Looked high defiance. Lo, his heart gan warm with pity, For the gray-haired creature wept. Had he then wronged a heart where sorrows kept? Had he, though blindly contumelious, brought room to kind eyes, a sting to human thought, convulsion to a mouth of many years? He had, in truth, and he was ripe for tears. The penitent shower fell as down he knelt before that careworn sage, who trembling felt about his large dark locks, and faltering spake. Arise, good youth! For sacred Phoebus' sake, I know thine inmost bosom, and I feel a very brother's yearning for thee steal into mine own. For why? Thou openst the prison gates that have so long oppressed my weary watching. Though thou knowest it not, thou art commissioned to this fated spot for great enfranchisement. Ah, oh, weep no more. I am a friend to love, to loves of yore. I, hadst thou never loved an unknown power, I had been grieving at this joyous hour. But even now, most miserable old, I saw thee, and my blood no longer cold, gave mighty pulses. In this tottering case grew a new heart, which at this moment plays as dancingly as thine. Be not afraid, for thou shalt hear the secret all displayed, now as we speed toward our joyous task. So saying, this young soul in age's mask went forward with the carrion side by side, resuming quickly thus, while ocean's tide hung swollen at their backs, and jeweled sands took silently their footprints. My soul stands so past the midway for mortality, and so I can prepare without a sigh to tell thee briefly all my joy and pain. I was a fisher once upon this main, and my boat danced in every creek and bay. Rough billows were my home by night and day, the seagulls not more constant, for I had no housing from the storm and tempest mad but hollow rocks, and they were palaces of silent happiness, of slumberous ease. Long years of misery have told me so, I. Thus it was one thousand years ago. One thousand years. Is it then possible to look so plainly through them? To dispel a thousand years with backward glance sublime? To breathe away as twere all scummy slime from off a crystal pool? To see its deep and one's own image from the bottom peep? Yes. Now I am no longer wretched thrall. My long captivity and moanings all are but a slime, a thin pervading scum, the which I breathe away, and thronging come, like days of yesterday, my youthful pleasures. I touched no lute, I sang not, trod no measures. I was a lonely youth on desert shores. My sports were lonely, mid continuous roars and craggy aisles and sea-mew's plaintive cry, plaining discrepant between sea and sky. Dolphins were still my playmates. Shapes unseen would let me feel their scales of gold and green, nor be my desolation. And, full oft, when a dead water-spout had reared aloft its hungry hugeness, seeming ready ripe to burst with horrid thunderings, and wipe my life away like a vast sponge of fate, some friendly monster, pitying my sad state, has dived to its foundations, gulped it down, and left me tossing safely. But the crown of all my life was utmost quietude. More did I love to lie in cavern rude, 
keeping in wait whole days for Neptune's voice, and if it came at last, hark and rejoice. There blush no summer eve, but I would steer my skiff along green shelving coasts, to hear the shepherd's pipe come clear from airy steep, mingled with ceaseless bleatings of his sheep. And never was a day of summer shine, but I beheld its birth upon the brine, for I would watch all night to see unfold heaven's gates, and Athan snort his morning gold wide o'er the swelling streams, and constantly, at brim of daytide, on some grassy lea, my nets would be spread out, and I at rest. The poor folk of the sea country I blessed with daily boon of fish most delicate. They knew not whence this bounty, and elate, would strew sweet flowers on a sterile beach. Why was I not contented? Wherefore reach at things which, but for thee, O Latmian, had been my dreary death? Fool, I began to feel distempered longings, to desire the utmost privilege that Ocean's sire could grant in benediction, to be free of all his kingdom. Long in misery I wasted, ere in one extremist fit I plunged for life or death. To interknit one's senses with so dense a breathing stuff might seem a work of pain, so not enough can I admire how crystal smooth it felt and buoyant round my limbs. At first I dwelt whole days and days in sheer astonishment, forgetful utterly of self-intent, moving but with the mighty ebb and flow, then, like a new-fledged bird that first doth show his spreaded feathers to the morrow chill, I tried and fear the pinions of my will. T'was freedom, and at once I visited the ceaseless wonders of this ocean bed. No need to tell thee of them, for I see that thou hast been a witness. It must be, for these I know thou canst not feel a drouth by the melancholy corners of that mouth. So I will, in my story, straightway pass to more immediate matter. Woe, alas, that love should be my bane. Ah, Scarla Fair, why did poor Glaucus ever, ever dare to sue thee to his heart? Kind stranger youth, I loved her to the very white of truth, and she would not conceive it. Timid thing. She fled me swift as seabird on the wing, round every isle and point and promontory, from where large Hercules wound up his story far as Egyptian Nile. My passion grew the more, the more I saw her dainty hue gleam delicately through the azure clear, until twas too fierce agony to bear, and in that agony across my grief it flashed, that Circe might find some relief cruel enchantress. So above the water I reared my head, and looked for Phoebus' daughter. Aeus's isle was wandering at the moon. It seemed to whirl about me, and a swoon left me dead drifting to that fatal power. End of section 11. Recording by Todd. Section 12 of Endymion. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Endymion by John Keats. Book 3, lines 420 to 617. When I awoke, t'was in a twilight bower, just when the light of morn, with hum of bees, stole through its virtuous matting of fresh trees. How sweet, and sweeter, for I heard a lyre, and over it a sighing voice expire. It ceased. I caught light footsteps, and anon the fairest face that morn e'er looked upon pushed through a screen of roses. Starry Jove! With tears and smiles and honey words she wove a net whose thraldom was more bliss than all the range of flowered Elysium. Thus did fall the dew of her rich speech. Ah, art awake? Oh, let me hear thee speak for Cupid's sake. I am so oppressed with joy, 
why i have shed an urn of tears as though thou wert cold dead and now i find thee living i will pour from these devoted eyes their silver store until exhausted of the latest drop so it will pleasure thee and force thee stop here that i too may live but if beyond such cool and sorrowful offerings thou art fond of soothing warmth of dalliance supreme if thou art ripe to taste a long-loved dream if smiles if dimples tongues for otter mute hung in thy vision like a tempting fruit oh let me pluck it for thee thus she linked her charming syllables till indistinct their music came to my o'er-sweetened soul and then she hovered over me and stole so near that if no near it had been this furrowed visage thou hadst never seen young man of latmos thus particular am i that thou mayest plainly see how far this fierce temptation went and thou mayst not exclaim how then was Skyla quite forgot who could resist who in this universe she did so breathe ambrosia so immerse my fine existence in a golden clime she took me like a child of suckling time and cradled me in roses thus condemned the current of my former life was stemmed and to this arbitrary queen of sense i bowed a trancid vassal nor would thence have moved even though Amphion's harp had wooed me back to Scylla o'er the billows rude. For as Apollo each eve doth devise a new apparelling for western skies, so every eve, nay, every spendthrift hour shed balmy consciousness within that bower, and I was free of haunts embragius, could wander in the mazy forest house of squirrels, foxes shy and antlered deer, and birds from coverts inmost and drear wobbling for very joy mellifluous sorrow to me new-born delights now let me borrow for moments few a temperament as stern as pluto's sceptre that my words not burn these uttering lips while i in calm speech tell how spacious heaven was changed to real hell one morn she left me sleeping half awake i sought for her smooth arms and lips to slake my greedy thirst with nectarous camel draughts but she was gone whereat the barbed shafts of disappointment stuck in me so sore that out i ran and searched the forest o'er dwaddling about in pine and cedar gloom damp awe assailed me for there began to boom a sound of moan an agony of sound sepulchral from the distance all around then came a conquering earth thunder and rumbled to that fierce complaint to silence while i stumbled down a precipitous path as if impelled i came to a dark valley groaning swelled poisonous about my ears and louder grew the nearer I approached, a flame's gaunt blue that glared before me through a thorny brake. This fire, like the eye of Gordian snake, bewitched me towards, and soon I was near a sight too fearful for the feel of fear. In thicket hid, I cursed the haggard scene. The banquet of my arms, my arbor queen, seated upon an uptorn forest root, and all around her shapes, wizard and brute laughing and wailing groveling serpenting showing tooth tusk and venom bag and sting oh such deformities old sharon's self should he give up a while his penny pelf and take a dream amongst rushes stygian it could not be so fantasized fierce worn and tyrannizing was the lady's look as over them a gnarled staff she shook. Oft times upon the sudden she laughed out, and from a basket emptied to the rout clusters of grapes, the which they ravened quick and roared for more, with many a hungry lick about their shaggy jaws. 
avenging, slow. Anon she took a branch of mistletoe and emptied it on a black dull gurgling file, groaned one and all, as if some piercing trial was sharpening for their pitiable bones. She lifted up the charm. Appealing groans from their poor breasts went suing to her ear in vain. Remorseless as an infant's buyer, she whisked against their eyes the sooty oil. Whereat was heard a noise of painful toil, increasing gradual to tempest rage, shrieks, yells, and groans of torture pilgrimage, until their grieved bodies began to bloat and puff from the tail's end to stifled throat. Then was appalling silence. Then a sight more wildering than all that hoary affright. For the whole herd, as by a whirlwind rhythm, went through the dismal air like one huge python, agonizing Boreas, and so vanished. Yet there was not a breath of wind. She banished these phantoms with a nod. Lo, from the dark came waggish fawns and nymphs and satyrs stark, with dancing and loud revelry, and went swifter than centaurs after rapine bent. Sighing an elephant appeared and bowed before the fierce witch, speaking thus aloud in human accent, Potent goddess, chief of pains resistless, make my being brief, or let me from this heavy prison fly, or give me to the air, or let me die. I sue not for my happy crown again, I sue not for my phalanx on the plain, I sue not for my lone, my widowed wife. I sue not for my ruddy drops of life, my children fair, my lovely girls and boys. I will forget them. I will pass these joys. Ask not so heavenward, so too, too high. Only I pray as fairest boon to die, or be delivered from this cumbrous flesh from this gross, detestable, filthy mesh, and merely given to the cold, bleak air. Have mercy, goddess. Circe, feel my prayer. That cursed magician's name fell icy numb upon my wild conjecturing. Truth had come, naked and saber-like against my heart. I saw a fury wedding a death dart, and my spirit slain, overwrought with fright, fainted away in that dark lair of night. Think, my deliverer, how desolate my waking must have been. Disgust and hate and terrors manifold divided me a spoil amongst them. I prepared to flee into the dungeon core of that wild wood. I fled three days, when, lo, before me stood glaring the angry witch. Oh, dees, even now, a clammy dew is beating on my brow at mere remembering her pale laugh and curse. Ha, ha, Sir Dainty, there must be a nurse made of robes, leaves, and thistledown, express to cradle thee, my sweet, and lull thee. Yes, I am too flinty hard for thy nice touch. My tenderest squeeze is but a giant's clutch. So, fairy thing... It shall have lullabies unheard of yet, and it shall still its cries upon some breast more lily feminine. Oh, no, it shall not pine and pine and pine more than one pretty trifling thousand years. And then, twere pity, but fate's gentle shears cut short its immortality. See, flirt, young dove of the waters, truly I'll not hurt one hair of thine. See how I weep and sigh that our heartbroken parting is so nigh? And must we part? Ah, yes, it must be so. Yet ere thou leavest me in utter woe, let me sob over thee my last adieus, and speak a blessing. Mark me, thou hast thews immortal, for thou art of heavenly race. But such a love is mine, that here I chase eternally away from thee, all bloom of youth, and destine thee towards a tomb. Hence shalt thou quickly to the watery vast, and there, ere many days be overpassed, 
disabled age shall seize thee, and even then thou shalt not go the way of aged men, but live and wither, cripple and still breathe ten hundred years, which gone, I then bequeath thy fragile bones to unknown burial. Adieu, sweet love, adieu. As shot stars fall, she fled ere I could groan for mercy. Stung and poisoned was my spirit. Despair sung a war song of defiance against all hell. A hand was at my shoulder to compel my sullen steps. Another for my eyes moved on with pointed finger. In this guise, enforced at the last by ocean's foam, I found me, by my fresh, my native home. Its tempering coolness to my life akin came salutary as I waded in, and, with a blind, voluptuous rage, I gave battle to the swollen billow ridge, and drave large froth before me, while there yet remained hail strength, nor from my bones all marrow drained. End of section 12 Recording by Todd Section 13 of Endemian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Endemian by John Keats. Book 3, lines 618 through 823. Young lover, I must weep. Such hellish spite with dry cheek who can tell? While thus my might proofing upon this element, dismayed. Upon a dead thing's face my hand I laid. I looked. T'was Skyla, cursed, cursed Circe, O vulture witch, hast thou never heard of mercy? Could not thou harshest vengeance be content, But thou must nip this tender innocent, Because I loved her? Cold, O oh, cold indeed were her fair limbs, And like a common weed the sea-swell took her hair. Dead as she was, I clung about her waist, Nor ceased to pass, fleet as an arrow through unfathomed brine, until there shone a fabric crystalline, ribbed and inlaid with coral, pebble and pearl. Headlong I darted, at one eager swirl gained its bright portal, entered, and, behold, t'was vast and desolate and icy cold, and all around. But wherefore this to thee, who in few minutes more thyself shalt see? I left poor Skyla in a niche, and fled. My fevered parchings up, my scathing dread, met palsy halfway. Soon these limbs became gaunt, withered, sapless, feeble, cramped, and lame. Now let me pass a cruel, cruel space, without one hope, without one faintest trace of mitigation or redeeming bubble of colored fantasy, for I fear t'would trouble thy brain to loss of reason and next tell how a restoring chance came down to quell one half of the witch and me. On a day, sitting upon a rock above the spray, I saw grow up from the horizon's brink a gallant vessel. Soon she seemed to sink away from me again, as though her course had been resumed in spite of hindering force. So vanished, and not long before arose dark clouds and muttering of winds morose. Old Aeolus would stifle his mad spleen, but could not, therefore all the billows green tossed up the silver spume against the clouds. The tempest came, I saw that vessel's shrouds in perilous bustle, while upon the deck stood trembling creatures. I beheld the wreck, the final gulfing, the poor struggling souls, I heard their cries amid loud thunder rolls. Oh, they had all been saved, but crazed El annulled my vigorous cravings, and thus quelled and curbed. Think, aunt, O oh, Latmian, did I sit writhing with pity and a cursing fit against the hell-born Circe? The crew had gone, by one and one, to pale oblivion, and I was gazing on the surges prone with many a scalding tear and many a groan, when at my feet emerged an old man's hand, grasping the scroll in the same slender wand. 
I knelt with pain, reached out my hand, had grasped these treasures, touched the knuckles, they unclasped. I caught a finger, but the downward weight o'erpowered me and sank. Then Jan abate the storm, and through chill aguish gloom outburst the comfortable sun. I was athirst to search the book, and in the warming air parted its dripping leaves with eager care. Strange matters did it treat of, and drew on my soul page after page, till well nigh won into forgetfulness, when, stupefied, I read these words, and read again, and tried my eyes against the heavens, and read again. Oh, what a load of misery and pain each atlas line bore off! A shine of hope came gold around me, cheering me to cope strenuous with hellish tyranny. Attend, for thou hast brought their promise to an end. In the wide sea there lives a forlorn wretch, doomed with enfeebled carcass to outstretch his loathed existence through ten centuries, and then to die alone. Who can devise a total opposition? No one. So one million times ocean must ebb and flow, and he oppressed. Yet he shall not die, these things accomplished, if he utterly scans all the depths of magic and expounds the meanings of all motions, shapes, and sounds. If he explores all forms and substances, straight homeward to their symbol essences, he shall not die. Moreover, and in chief he must pursue this task of joy and grief most piously. All lovers, tempest-tossed, and in the savage overwhelming, lost, he shall deposit side by side, until time's creeping shall the dreary space fulfill, which done and all these labors ripen, a youth by heavenly power, loved and led, shall stand before him, whom he shall direct how to consummate all. The youth elect must do the thing, or both will be destroyed. Then cried the young Endymion, overjoyed, We are twin brothers in this destiny. Say, I entreat thee, what achievement high is in this restless world for me reserved? What if from thee my wandering feet had swerved, had we both perished? Look, the sage replied, Dost thou not mark a gleaming through the tide of divers brilliances? "'Tis the edifice I told thee of, where lovely Scylla lies, "'and where I have enshrined piously all lovers "'whom fell storms have doomed to die throughout my bondage. "'Thus discoursing, on they went till unobscured the porches shone, "'which hurryingly they gained and entered straight. "'Sure, never since King Neptune held his state "'was seen such wonder underneath the stars.' turned to some level plain where haughty Mars has legioned all his battle, and behold how every soldier with firm foot doth hold his even breast. See many steeled squares and rigid ranks of iron, whence who dares one step. Imagine further, line by line, these warrior thousands on the field supine, so that in that crystal place, in silent rows, pure lovers lay at rest from joys and woes. The stranger from the mountains, breathless, traced such thousands of shut eyes in order placed, such ranges of white feet and patient lips all ruddy, for here death no blossom nips. He marked their brows and foreheads, saw their hair put sleekly on one side with nicest care, and each one's gentle wrists with reference, put crosswise to its heart. Let us commence, whispered the guide, stuttering with joy even now. He spake, and, trembling like an aspen bough, began to tear his scroll in pieces small, uttering the while some mumblings funereal. He tore it into pieces small as snow, that drifts unfeathered when bleak northerns blow, and having done it, took his dark blue cloak and bound it round in Demian, then struck his wand against the empty air times nine. What more there is to do, young man, is thine. But first a little patience, First undo this tangled thread, and wind it to a clue. Ah, gentle, tis as weak as spider's skein, and shouldst thou break it, what is it done so clean? A power overshadows thee, O brave, the spite of hell is tumbling to its grave. Here is a shell, tis pearly blank to me, nor marked with any sign or charactery. Canst thou read aught? O read, for pity's sake, Olympus, we are safe, now 
carry him break this wand against yon liar on the pedestal twas done and straight with sudden swell and fall sweet music breathed her soul away and sighed a lullaby to silence youth now strew these minced leaves on me and passing through those files of dead scatter the same around and thou wilt see the issue mid the sound of flutes and viols ravishing his heart endymion from glaucus stood apart and scattered his face in some fragments white how lightning swift the change a youthful white smiling beneath a coral diadem out sparkling sudden like an upturned gem appeared and stepping to a beauteous course kneeled down beside it and with tenderest force pressed its cold hand and wept and scylla sighed and demian with quick hand the charm applied the nymph arose he left them to their joy and onward went upon his high employ showering those powerful fragments on the dead and as he passed each lifted up its head as doth a flower at apollo's touch death felt it to its inwards twas too much death fell a-weeping in his charnel house the latmian persevered along and thus all were reanimated there arose a noise of harmony pulses and throes of gladness in the air while many who had died in mutual arms devout and true sprang to each other madly and the rest felt a high certainty of being blessed they gazed upon endemion enchantment grew drunken and would have its head and bent delicious symphonies like airy flowers budded and swelled and full-blown shed full showers of light soft unseen leaves of sounds divine the two deliverers tasted a pure wine of happiness from fairy press oozed out speechless they eyed each other and about the fair assembly wandered to and fro distracted from the richest overflow of joy that ever poured from heaven away shouted the new-born god follow and pay our piety to neptunus supreme then scylla blushing sweetly from her dream they led on first bent to her meek surprise through portal columns of a giant size into the vaulted boundless emerald joyous all followed as the leader called down marble steps pouring as easily as hour-glass sand and fast as you might see swallows obeying the south summer's call or swans upon a gentle waterfall end of section thirteen section fourteen of endymion this librivox recording is in the public domain endymion by john keats book three lines eight twenty four through one thousand forty three thus went that beautiful multitude nor far ere from among some rocks of glittering spar just within ken they saw descending thick another multitude whereat more quick moved i the host on a wide sand they met and of those numbers every eye was wet for each their old love found a murmuring rose like what was never heard in all the throes of wind and waters tis past human wit to tell tis dizziness to think of it this mighty consummation made the host moved on for many a league and gained and lost huge sea marts vanward swelling in array and from the rare diminishing away till a faint dawn surprised them glaucus cried behold behold the palace of his pride god neptune's palaces with noise increased they shouldered on towards that brightening cast at every onward step proud domes arose in prospect diamond gleams and golden glows of amber against their faces levelling joyous and many as the leaves in spring still onward still the splendour gradual swelled rich opal domes were seen on high upheld by jasper pillars letting through their shafts a blush of coral copious wonder draughts each gazer drank and deeper drank more near for what poor mortals fragment up as mere as marble was there lavish to the vast of one fair palace that far far surpassed even for common bulk those olden three memphis and babylon and nineveh 
as large as bright, as coloured as the bow of iris. When unfading it doth show, beyond a silvery shower, was the arch through which the Spafian army took its march into the outer courts of Neptune's state, whence could be seen direct a golden gate to which the leaders sped, but not half wrought, ere it burst open swift as fairy thought, and made those dazzled thousands veil their eyes, like callow eagles at the first sunrise. Soon with an eagle nativeness their gaze, ripe from hue golden swoons, took all the blaze, and then behold, large Neptune on his throne, of emerald deep, yet not exalt alone, at his right stood winged love, and on his left sat smiling beauty's paragon, far as the mariner on highest mast, can see all round upon the calmed vast, so wide was Neptune's hall, and as the blue doth vault the waters, so the waters drew their doming curtains, high, magnificent, awed from the throne aloof, and when storm rent, disclosed the thunder gloomings in Jove's air, but soothed as now, flashed sudden everywhere, noiseless, submarine cloudlets glittering, death to a human eye, for there did spring, from natural west and east and south and north, a light as of four sunsets blazing forth, a gold-green zenith, above the sea-god's head, of lucid depth the floor, and far outspread, as breezeless lake, on which the slim canoe of feathered Indian darts about, as through the delicatest air, air verily, but for the portraiture of clouds and sky, this palace floor breath air, but for the amaze of deep-seen wonders motionless, and blaze of the dome pomp reflected in extremes, globing a golden sphere. They stood in dreams, till Triton blew his horn, the palace rang, the Nereids danced, the Sirens faintly sang, and the great sea-king bowed his dripping head, then love took wing, and from his pinions shed on all the multitude a nectarous dew, the ooze-born goddess beckoned and drew, fair Scylla and her guides to conference. And when they reached the throne eminence, she kissed the sea-nymph's cheek who sat her down, a toying with the doves. Then, mighty crown and scepter of this kingdom, Venus said, thy vows were on a time to Nais paid. Behold, Two copious teardrops instant fell from the god's large eyes. He smiled delectable, and over Glaucus held his blessing hands. Endymion, ah, still wandering in the bands of love? Now this is cruel, since the hour I met thee in earth's bosom. All my power have I put forth to serve thee. What, not yet escaped from dull mortality's harsh net? A little patience, youth, twill not be long, or I am skinless quite, an idle tongue, a humid eye, and steps luxurious, where these are new and strange, are ominous. I, I have seen these signs in one of heaven, when others were all blind, and were I given to utter secrets, haply I might say, some pleasant words, but love will have his day. So wait a while, expectant. Prithee soon, even in the passing of thine honeymoon, visit my Cytheria. Thou wilt find Cupid well-natured, my Adonis kind, and pray persuade with thee, ah, I have done. All blisses be upon thee, my sweet son. Thus the fair goddess, while Endymion knelt to receive those accents halcyon. Meantime a glorious revelry began, before the water monarch, nectar ran in courteous fountains to all cups outreached, and plundered vines, teeming exhaustless bleached, new growth about each shell and pendant lyre, the which in disentangling for their fire, pulled down fresh foliage and coverture for dainty toying. Cupid, empire sure, fluttered and laughed, and oft times through the throng, 
made a delightful way. Then dance and song and garlanding grew wild and pleasure reigned. In harmless tendril they each other chained and strove who should be smothered deepest in fresh crush of leaves. Oh, tis a very sin for one so weak to venture his poor verse in such a place as this. Oh, do not curse, high muses, let him hurry to the ending. All suddenly was silent. A soft blending of dulcet instruments came charmingly, and then a hymn. King of the stormy sea, brother of Jove, and co-inheritor of elements, eternally before thee the waves awful bow, fast stubborn rock at thy fear tried and shrinking, doth unlock its deep foundations hissing into foam all mountain rivers lost in the wide home of thy capacious bosom ever flow thou frownest and old aeolus thy foe skulks to his cavern mid the gruff complain of all his rebel tempests dark clouds faint and from thy diadem a silver gleam slants over blue dominion thy bright team gulfs in the morning light and scuds along to bring thee nearer to that golden song apollo singeth while his chariot waits at the doors of heaven thou art not for scenes like this an empire stern hast thou, and it hath furrowed that large front. Yet now, as newly come of heaven, dost thou sit to blend an internet, subdued majesty, with this glad time. O shell-born king sublime, we lay our hearts before thee evermore, we sing and we adore breathe softly flutes be tender of your strings ye soothing lutes nor be the trumpet heard o vain o vain not flowers budding in an april rain nor breath of sleeping dove nor rivers flow no nor the yulian tang of love's own bow can mingle music fit for the soft ear of goddess Cytheria, yet deign white queen of beauty thy fair eyes on our soul sacrifice bright-winged child who has another care when thou hast smiled unfortunates on earth we see at last all death shadows and glooms that overcast our spirits fanned away by thy light pinions o sweetest essence sweetest of all minions god of warm pulses and dishevelled hair and panting bosom spare dear unseen light in darkness eclipser of light and light delicious poisoner thy venomed goblet will we quaff until we fill we fill and by thy mother's lips was heard no more for clamour when the golden palace door opened again and from without in shone a new magnificence on oozy throne smooth moving came oshinus the old to take a latest glimpse at his sheepfold before he went into his quiet cave to muse forever then a lucid wave scooped from its trembling sisters of mid-sea afloat and pillowing up the majesty of doris and the aegean seer her spouse next on a dolphin clad in laurel boughs theban amphion leaning on his lute his fingers went across it all were mute to gaze on amphitrite queen of pearls, and Thetis, pearly too. The palace worlds around giddy Endymion, seeing he was there far straight from mortality. He could not bear it, shut his eyes in vain. Imagination gave a dizzier pain. 
Oh, I shall die, sweet Venus, be my stay. Where is my lovely mistress? Well away. I die, I hear her voice, I feel my wing. At Neptune's feet he sank, a sudden ring of nereids were about him in kind strife to usher back his spirit into life. But still he slept. At last they interwove their cradling arms and purpose to convey towards a crystal bower far away. Lo, while slow carried through the pitying crowd, to his inward senses these words spake aloud, written in starlight on the dark above. Dearest Endymion, my entire love, how have I dwelt in fear of fate? Tis done. Immortal bliss for me too hast thou won. Arise then, for the hen dove shall not hatch her ready eggs, before I'll kissing snatch thee into endless heaven. Awake, awake! The youth at once arose, a placid lake came quiet to his eyes, and forest green, cooler than all the wonders he had seen, lulled with its simple song his fluttering breast. How happy once again in grassy nest! End of section 14section 15 of endymion this librivox recording is in the public domain endymion by john keats book 4 lines 1 through 292 muse of my native land loftiest muse o first born on the mountains by the hues of heaven on the spiritual air begot long didst thou sit alone in northern grot while yet our england was a wolfish den, before our forests heard the talk of men, before the first of druids was a child. Long didst thou sit amid our regions wild, wrapped in a deep prophetic solitude. There came an eastern voice of solemn mood. Yet was thou patient. Then sang forth the nine, Apollo's garland. Yet didst thou divine such homebred glory, that they cried in vain, Come hither, sister of the island. Plain spake fair Ausonia, and once more she spake a higher summons. Still didst thou betake thee to thy native hopes. O thou hast won a full accomplishment. The thing is done, which undone, these our latter days had risen on barren souls. Great muse, thou knowest what prison of flesh and bone curbs and confines, and frets our spirit's wings. Despondency besets our pillows, and the fresh tomorrow morn seems to give forth its light in every scorn of our dull, uninspired, snail-paced lives. Long have I said, how happy he who shrives to thee. But then I thought on poets gone, and could not pray, nor can I now. So on I move, to the end in lowliness of heart. Ah, woe is me, that I should fondly part from my dear native land. Ah, foolish maid, glad was the hour ah, when with thee myriads bade adieu to Ganges and their pleasant fields. To one so friendless, the clear freshet yields a bitter coolness, the ripe grape is sour. Yet I would have, great gods, but one short hour of native air, let me but die at home. Endymion to heaven's airy dome was offering up a hecatomb of vows when these words reached him, whereupon his bows, his head through thorny green entanglement of underwood, and to the sound is bent, anxious as hind towards her hidden fawn. Is no one near to help me? No fair dawn of life from charitable voice? No sweet saying to set my dull and saddened spirit plain? No hand to toy with mine? No lips so sweet that I may worship them? No eyelids meet to twinkle on my bosom? No one dies before me, till from these enslaving eyes redemption sparkles. I am sad and lost. Thou, Carrion Lord, hadst better have been tossed into a whirlpool. Vanish into air, warm mountaineer, 
For canst thou only bear a woman's sigh alone and in distress? See not her charms. Is Phoebe passionless? Phoebe is fairer far. O gaze no more. Yet if thou wilt behold all beauty's store, behold her panting in the forest grass. Do not those curls of glossy jet surpass for tenderness, the arms so idly lain amongst them. Feelest not a kindred pain to see such lovely eyes in swimming search after some warm delight that seems to perch dove-like in the dim cell lying beyond their upper lids hissed o oh, for hermes wand to touch this flower into human shape that woodland hyacinthus could escape from his green prison and here kneeling down call me his queen his second life's fair crown ah me how i could love my soul doth melt for the unhappy youth love i have felt so faint a kindness such a meek surrender to what my own full thoughts had made too tender that but for tears my life had fled away ye deaf and senseless minutes of the day and thou old forest hold ye this for true there is no lightning no authentic dew but in the eye of love there's not a sound melodious howsoever can confound the heavens and earth in one to such a death as doth the voice of love there's not a breath will mingle kindly with the meadow air till it has panted round and stolen a share of passion from the heart upon a bow he leant wretched he surely cannot now thirst for another love o oh, impious that he can even dream upon it thus thought he why am i not as are the dead since to a woe like this i have been led through the dark earth and through the wondrous sea goddess i love thee not the less from thee by juno's smile i turn not no 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 while the great waters are at ebb and flow i have a triple soul o fond pretence for both for both my love is so immense i feel my heart is cut in twain for them and so he groaned as one by beauty slain the lady's heart beat quick and he could see her gentle bosom heave tumultuously he sprang from his green covert there she lay sweet as a musk rose upon new-made hay with all her limbs on tremble and her eyes shut softly up alive to speak he tries fair damsel pity me forgive that i thus violate thy bower's sanctity o oh, pardon me for i am full of grief grief born of thee young angel fairest thief who stolen hast away the wings wherewith i was to top the heavens dear maid sith thou art my executioner and i feel loving and hatred misery and weal will in a few short hours be nothing to me and all my story that much passion slew me do smile upon the evening of my days and for my tortured brain begins to craze be thou my nurse and let me understand how dying i shall kiss that lily hand dost weep for me then should i be content scowl on ye fates until the firmament outblackens erebus and the full caverned earth crumbles into itself by the cloud girth of jove those tears have given me a thirst to meet oblivion as her heart would burst the maiden sobbed a while and then replied why must such desolation be tied as that thou speakest of are not these green nooks empty of all misfortune do the brooks utter a gorgon voice does yonder thrush schooling its half-fledged little ones to brush about the dewy forest whisper tales speak not of grief young stranger or cold snails will slime the rose to-night though if thou wilt methinks twould be a guilt a very guilt not to companion thee and sigh away the light the dusk the dark till break of day dear lady said endymion tis past 
I love thee, and my days can never last, that I may pass in patience, still speak. Let me have music dying, and I seek no more delight. I bid adieu to all. Didst thou not after other climates call, and murmur about Indian streams? Then she, sitting beneath the midmost forest tree, for pity sang this roundly. O sorrow, why dost borrow the natural hue of health from vermeil lips to give maiden blushes to the white rose bushes? Or is it thy dewy hand the daisy tips? O sorrow, why dost borrow the lustrous passion from a falcon eye to give the glowworm light? Or on a moonless night, to tinge on siren shores the salt sea spray. O sorrow, why dost borrow the mellow ditties from a morning tongue, to give at evening pale unto the nightingale, that thou mayst listen the cold dews among? O sorrow, why dost borrow? Heart's lightness from the merriment of May. A lover would not tread a cowslip on the head, though he should dance from eve till peep of day. Nor any drooping flower held sacred from thy power, wherever he may sport himself and play. To sorrow I bid good morrow. And thought to leave her far away behind. But surely, surely, she loves me dearly. She is so constant to me and so kind. I would deceive her and so leave her. But ah, she is so constant and so kind. Beneath my palm trees by the river side. I sat a weeping in the whole world wide. There was no one to ask me why I wept, and so I kept brimming the water lily cups with tears cold as my fears. Beneath my palm trees by the river side, I sat a weeping, what enamoured bride. Cheated by a shadowy wooer from the clouds, but hides and shrouds beneath dark palm trees by a riverside. And as I sat over the light blue hills, there came a noise of revellers. The rills into the wide stream came of purple hue. Twas Bacchus and his crew. The earnest trumpet spake. And silver thrills from kissing cymbals made a merry din. Twas Bacchus and his kin, like to a moving vintage town they came, crowned with green leaves, faces all on flame, all madly dancing through the pleasant valley to scare thee melancholy. Oh, then, oh, then. Thou wast a simple name, and I forgot thee as the buried holly by shepherds is forgotten. When in June, tall chestnuts keep away the sun and moon. I rushed into the folly. Within his car, a loft young Bacchus stood, trifling his ivy dart in dancing mood. With side long laughing, and little rills of crimson wine imbrued his plump white arms and shoulders enough white for Venus' pearly bite, and near him rode Silenus on his ass, belted with flowers as he on did pass, tipsily quaffing. Whence came he, merry damsels? Whence came he? So many and so many and such glee, why have ye left your bowers desolate, your lutes and gentler fate? We follow Bacchus, Bacchus on the wing, a conquering Bacchus, 
Young Bacchus, good or ill betide, we dance before him, Tara kingdoms wide. Come hither, lady fair, and join me to our wild minstrelsy. Whence came ye, jolly satyrs? Whence came ye? So many and so many, and such glee. Why have ye left your forest haunts? Why left your nuts in oak tree cleft? For wine, for wine we left our kernel tree. For wine we left our heath and yellow brooms and cold mushrooms. For wine we follow Bacchus through the earth. Great god of breathless cups and chirping mirth, come hither, lady fair, and join me to our mad minstrelsy. Over wide streams and mountains great we went, and save when Bacchus kept his ivy tent, onward the tiger and the leopard pants, with Asian elephants, onward these myriads, with song and dance, with zebras striped and sleek Arabians prance, web-footed alligators, crocodiles bearing upon their scaly backs in files, plump infant lovers mimicking the coil of seamen, and stout galley rowers toil with towing oars and silken sails they glide nor care for wind and tide mounted on panthers furs and lions manes from rare to van they scar about the plains a three days journey in a moment done and always at the rising sun about the wilds they hunt with spear and horn on spleenful unicorn I saw Osirian Egypt kneel down before the fine wreath crown. I saw parched Abyssinia rouse and sing to the silver cymbals ring. I saw the whelming vintage hotly pierce, old Tartary the fierce, the kings of Indy, their jewelled scepters fail, and from their treasures scatter world hail great brahma from his mystic heaven groans and all his priesthood moans before young bacchus i wink turning pale into these regions came i following him sick-hearted weary so i took a whim to stray away into these forests dear alone without a peer and i have told thee all thou mayest hear young stranger i've been a ranger in search of pleasure throughout every clime alas tis not for me bewitched i sure must be to lose in grieving all my maiden prime Come then sorrow, sweet as sorrow, like an own babe I nurse thee on my breast. I thought to leave thee and deceive thee, but now of all the world I love thee best. There is not one, no, no, not one, but thee to comfort a poor lonely maid. Thou art her mother and her brother her playmate and her wooer in the shade. End of section 15。Section 16 of Endymion。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Endymion by John Keats. Book 4, lines 293 to 513. Oh, what a sigh she gave in finishing, and look quite dead to every worldly thing. Endymion could not speak, but gazed on her, 
and listened to the wind that now did stir. About the crisped oaks full drearily, yet with as sweet a softness as might be, remembered from its velvet summer song. At last he said, Poor lady, how thus long have I been able to endure that voice? Fair melody, kind siren, I've no choice. I must be thy sad servant evermore. I cannot choose but kneel here and adore. Alas, I must not think, by Phoebe, no. Let me not think, soft angel, shall it be so? Say, beautifulest, shall I never think? O oh, thou couldst foster me beyond the brink. Of recollection, make my watchful care. Close up its bloodshot eyes, nor see despair. Do gently murder half my soul, and I shall feel the other half so utterly. I'm giddy at that cheek so fair and smooth. Oh, let it blush so ever, let it soothe. My madness, let it mantle rosy warm with a tinge of love panting in safe alarm. This cannot be thy hand, and yet it is, and this is sure thine other softling, this. Thine own fair bosom, and I am so near, wilt fall asleep? Oh, let me sip that tear, and whisper one sweet word that I may know this is the world's sweet dewy blossom woe. Woe, woe to that endymion, where is he? Even these words went echoing dismally. Through the wide forest a most fearful tone, like one repenting in his latest moan, and while it died away a shade passed by, as of a thundercloud when arrows fly. Through the thick branches poor ring doves sleek forth, their timid necks and tremble, so these both leant to each other trembling, and sat so, waiting for some destruction, when, lo, foot-feathered mercury appeared sublime beyond the tall treetops, and in less time. Then shoots the slanted hailstorm, down he dropped towards the ground, but rested not, nor stopped. One moment from his home, only the sward. He with his wand light touched and heavenward. Swifter than sight was gone even before, the teeming earth a sudden witness bore. Of his swift magic diving swans appear above the crystal circlings white and clear and catch the cheated eye in wild surprise how they can dive in sight and unseen rise. So from the turf out sprang two steeds jet black each with large dark blue wings upon his back. The youth of Caria placed the lovely dame on one and felt himself in spleen to tame. The other's fierceness, through the air they flew, high as the eagles like two drops of dew. Exhale to Phoebus's lips, away they are gone. Far from the earth away, unseen, alone. Among cool clouds and winds, but that the free, the buoyant life of song can floating be above their heads, and follow them untired. Muse of my native land, am I inspired? This is the giddy air, and I must spread wide pinions to keep here, nor do I dread. Or height, or depth, or width, or any chance, precipitous I have beneath my glance. Those towering horses and their mournful freight, could I thus sail and see and thus await, fearless for power of thought without thine aid? There is a sleepy dusk, an odorous shade. From some approaching wonder, and behold, those winged steeds with snorting nostrils bold, snuff at its faint extreme, and seem to tire, dying to embers from their native fire. There curled a purple mist around them soon. It seemed as when around the pale new moon, sad zephyr droops the clouds like weeping willow. "'Twas sleep slow journeying with head on pillow. 
For the first time since he came nigh dead born, from the old womb of night his cave forlorn, had he left more forlorn for the first time, he felt aloof the day and morning's prime, because into his depth Sumerian there came a dream, shewing how a young man, ere a lean bat could plump its wintry skin, would at high Jove's imperial footstool win an immortality, and how espouse Jove's daughter and be reckoned of his house. Now he was slumbering towards heaven's gate, that he might at the threshold one hour wait to hear the marriage melodies, and then sink downward to his dusky cave again, his litter of smooth, semi-lucent mist, diversely tinged with rose and amethyst, puzzled those eyes that for the center sought, and scarcely for one moment could be caught. His sluggish form reposing motionless, those two on winged steeds with all the stress, a vision searched for him as one would look athwart the sallows of a river nook to catch a glance at silver-throated eels, or from old Skiddaw's top, when fog conceals his rugged forehead in a mantle pale, with an eye guessed toward some pleasant veil, descry a favorite hamlet, faint and far. These raven horses, though they fostered are of earth's splenetic fire dully drop, their full-veined ears, nostrils, blood wide and stop, upon the spiritless mist have they outspread. Their ample feathers are in slumber dead, and on those pinions level in midair, and Dimian sleepeth and the lady fair. Slowly they sail, slowly as icy isle, upon a calm sea drifting, and meanwhile the mournful wanderer dreams. Behold, he walks on heaven's pavement, brotherly he talks to divine powers from his hand full fain juno's proud birds are pecking pearly grain he tries the nerve of phoebus golden bough and asketh where the golden apples growl upon his arm he braces pallas shield and strives in vain to unsettle and wield a Jovian thunderbolt arch Hebe brings, a full brink goblet dances lightly sings, and tantalizes long, at last he drinks, and lost in pleasure at her feet he sinks, touching with dazzled lips her starlight hand. He blows a bugle, an ethereal band, are visible above the season's four, green curdled spring, flush summer, golden store, in autumn sickle, winter frosty hoar, join dance with shadowy hours, while still the blast, in swells unmitigated, still doth last to sway their floating morris. Who is this? Whose bugle? he inquires, they smile. Oh, dis. Why is this mortal here? Dost thou not know its mistress' lips? Not thou, tis Dian's low. She rises crescented, he looks, tis she, his very goddess, good-bye, earth and sea, and air and pains and care and suffering, good-bye to all but love. Then doth he spring, towards her and awakes and strange o'erhead, of those same fragrant exhalations bred. Beheld awake his very dream, the gods stood smiling. Mary Hebe laughs and nods, and Phoebe bends towards him, crescented. Oh, stay perplexing on the pinion bed. Too well awake, he feels the panting side of his delicious lady, he who died for soaring too audacious in the sun where that same treacherous wax began to run felt not more tongue-tied than endymion his heart leapt up as to its rightful throne to that fair shadow passion pulsed its way ah what perplexity ah well a day 
So fond, so beauteous was his bedfellow, he could not help but kiss her, then he grew. A while forgetful of all beauty save, young Phoebe's golden haired and so gan crave forgiveness, yet he turned once more to look at the sweet sleeper, all his soul was shook. She pressed his hand and slumbered so once more. He could not help but kiss her and adore. At this the shadow wept, melting away. The Latmian started up, bright goddess, stay. Search my most hidden breast by truth's own tongue. I have no dadeal heart. Why is it wrung? To desperation, is there naught for me upon the bourne of bliss but misery? These words awoke the stranger of dark tresses. Her dawning love look wrapped and dimmy and blesses with behavior soft. Sleep yawned from underneath. Thou swan of Ganges, let us no more breathe. This murky phantasm thou contented seemst. Pillowed in love idleness nor dreamst. What horrors may discomfort thee and me? Ah, shouldst thou die from my heart treachery yet did she merely weep her gentle soul hath no revenge in it as is whole in tenderness would i were whole in love can i prize thee fair maid till price above even when i feel as true as in a sense i do i do what is this soul then whence came it it does not seem my own and i have no self-passion or identity some fearful end must be. Where, where is it? By nemesis I see my spirit flit. Alone about the dark forgave me sweet. Shall we away? He roused the steeds they beat. Their wings chivalrous into the clear air, Leaving old sleep within his vapory lair. The good night blush of eve was waning slow, and vesper risen star began to throw in the dusk heaven silvery when they thus sprang direct towards the galaxy. Nor did speed hinder converse soft and strange, eternal oaths and vows they interchange. In such wise, in such temper so aloof, up in the winds beneath a starry roof, so witless of their doom that verily tis well nigh past man's search their hearts to see whether they wept or laughed or grieved or toyed most like with joy gone mad with sorrow cloyed fell facing their swift flight from ebon streak the moon put forth a little diamond peak no bigger than an unobserved star or tiny point of fairy scimitar, bright signals that she only stooped to tie. Her silver sandals aired deliciously, she bowed into the heavens her timid head. Slowly she rose, as though she would have fled, while to his lady meek the carrion turned, to mark if her dark eyes had yet discerned this beauty in its birth despair despair he saw her body fading gaunt and spare in the cold moonshine straight he seized her wrist it melted from his grasp her hand he kissed and horror kissed his own he was alone her steed a little higher soared and then dropped hawkwise to the earth End of section 16. Section 17 of Endymion. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Endymion by John Keats. Book number four. Lines 514 to 775. There lies a den beyond the seeming confines of the space, made for the soul to wander in and trace. Its own existence of remotest glooms, dark regions are around it, where the tombs of buried griefs the spirit sees but scarce. One hour doth linger weeping for the pierce, 
of newborn woe it feels more inly smart. And in these regions many a venom dart. At random flies they are the proper home. Of every ill the man is yet to come. Who hath not journeyed in this native hell, But few have ever felt how calm and well Sleep may be had in that deep den of all. Their anguish does not sting, nor pleasure pall. Woe hurricanes beat ever at the gate, Yet all is still within and desolate. Beset with plainful gusts within ye hear No sound so loud as when on curtained beer The death-watch tick is stifled, enter none Who strive, therefore, on the sudden it is one. Just when the sufferer begins to burn, then it is free to him and from an urn. Still fed by melting ice, he takes a draught. Young Semele, such richness never quaffed. In her maternal longing, happy gloom, dark paradise where pale becomes the bloom. Of health by dew where silence dreariest is most articulate where hopes infest. Where those eyes are the brightest far that keep their lids shut longest in a dreamless sleep. O oh, happy spirit home, O oh, wondrous soul, pregnant with such a den to save the whole. In thine own depth hail, gentle carrion, for never since thy griefs and woes began. Hast thou felt so content a grievous feud? Hath let thee to this cave of quietude? I, his lulled soul, was there, although upborne, with dangerous speed, and so he did not mourn, because he knew not whither he was going. So happy was he, not the aerial blowing of trumpets at clear parley from the east could rouse from that fine relish that high feast. They stung the feathered horse with fierce alarm. He flapped towards the sound. Alas, no charm could lift Endymion's head, or he had viewed a skyey mask, a pinioned multitude. And silvery was its passing, voices sweet, warbling the while as if to lull and greet. The wanderer in his path thus warbled they, while past the vision went in bright array. Who, who from Dian's feast would be away for all the golden bowers of the day? Are empty left? Who, who away would be from Cynthia's wedding and festivity? Not Hesperus, low upon his silver wings. He leans away for highest heaven and sings, snapping his lucid fingers merrily. Ah, Zephyrus, art here and Flora too. Ye tender bibbers of the rain and dew, young playmates of the rose and daffodil, be careful ere ye enter in to fill your baskets high with fennel green and balm and golden pine, savory ladder mint and columbines. Cool parsley, basil sweet, and sunny thyme. Yea, every flower and leaf of every clime. All gathered in the dewy morning high, away, fly, fly. Crystalline brother of the belt of heaven, Aquarius to whom King Jove has given, Two liquid pulse streams instead of feathered wings, Two fan-like fountains thine illuminings, For Dian play, dissolve the frozen purity of air, Let thy white shoulders silvery bare, Shoe cold through watery pinions, make more bright the star queen's crescent on her marriage night. Haste, haste away. Castor has tamed the planet lion, see? And of the bear has Pollux mastery. A third is in the race. Who is the third? Speeding away swift as the eagle bird, the ramping centaur, the lion's manes on end. The bear, how fierce! The centaur's arrow ready seems to pierce some enemy. Far forth his bow is bent. Into the blue of heaven he'll be shent. 
pale unrelentor, when he shall hear the wedding lutes a-playing. Andromeda, sweet woman, why delaying? So timidly among the stars come hither, join this bright thong and nimbly follow whither they all are going. Danae's son before Jove newly bowed, has wept for thee, calling to Jove aloud. Thee, gentle lady, did he disenthrall. Ye shall forever live in love for all. Thy tears are flowing. By Daphne's fright, behold Apollo, more, Endymion heard not, down his steed him bore, Prone to the green head of a misty hill. His first touch of the earth went nigh to kill. Alas, he said, were I but always born Through dangerous winds, had but my footsteps worn, A path in hell forever would I bless, Horrors which nourish an uneasiness. From my own sullen conquering to him, who lives beyond earth's boundary, grief is dim. Sorrow is but a shadow, now I see. The grass, I feel the solid ground, ah me! It is thy voice, divinest. Where, who, who, left thee so quiet on this bed of dew? Behold upon this happy earth we are. Let us, I, love each other, let us fare on forest fruits, and never, never go among the abodes of mortals here below, or be by phantoms duped, O destiny, into a labyrinth now my soul would fly, but with thy beauty will I deaden it? Where didst thou melt to? By thee will I sit. Forever let our fate stop here, a kid. I on this spot will offer, Pan will bid, us live in peace, in love and peace among his forest wilderness. I have clung to nothing, love doth nothing, nothing seen, or felt but a great dream. Oh, have I been presumptuous against love, against the sky, against all elements, against the tie of mortals each to each against the blooms of flowers, rush of rivers, and the tombs of heroes gone against his proper glory. Has my own soul conspired so my story? Will I to children utter and repent? There never lived a mortal man who bent his appetite beyond his natural sphere but starved and died, my sweetest Indian, here. Here will I kneel, for thou redeemed hast, my life from tooth and breathing, gone and past. Our cloudy phantasms, caverns lone, farewell, and air of visions and the monstrous swell of visionary seas, no, never more, shall airy voices cheat me to the shore of tangled wonder, breathless and aghast. Adieu, my daintiest dream, although so vast. My love is still for thee, the hour may come when we shall meet in pure Elysium. On earth I may not love thee, and therefore doves will I offer up and sweetest store. All through the teeming year so thou wilt shine, on me and on this damsel fair of mine and bless our simple lives my indian bliss my river lily bud one human kiss one sigh of real breath one gentle squeeze warm as a dove's nest among summer trees and warm with dew at ooze from living blood whither didst melt ah what of that all good We'll talk about no more of dreaming now. Where shall our dwelling be under the brow Of some steep mossy hill where ivy dun Would hide us up, although spring leaves were none? And where dark yew trees, as we rustle through, Will drop their scarlet berry cups of dew? Oh, thou wouldst joy to live in such a place, Dusk for our loves, yet light enough to grace. Those gentle limbs on mossy bed reclined, for by one step the blue sky shouldst thou find 
and by another in deep dell below, see through the trees a little river go, all in its midday golden glimmering. Honey from out the gnarled hive I'll bring, and apples wan with sweetness gather thee, cresses that grow where no man may them see, and sorrel untorn by the dew-clawed stag. Pipes will I fashion of the syrinx flag, that thou mayst always know whither I roam, when it shall please thee in our quiet home, to listen and think of love, Still let me speak, still let me dive into the joy I seek, for yet the past doth prison me. The rill thou haply mayst delight in will I fill with fairy fishes from the mountain tarn, and thou shalt feed them from the squirrel's barn. Its bottom will I strew with amber shells, and pebbles blue from deep enchanted wells its sides i'll plant with dew-sweet eglantine and honeysuckles full of clear bee wine i will entice this crystal rill to trace love's silver name upon the meadow's face i'll kneel to vesta for a flame of fire and to god phoebus for a golden lyre to Empress Dian for a hunting spear, to Vesper for a taper silver clear, that I may see thy beauty through the night, to Flora and a nightingale shall light, tame on thy finger to the river gods, and they shall bring thee taper fishing rods of gold and lines of naiad's long bright tress. Heaven shield thee for thine utter loveliness. Thy mossy footstool shall the altar be, For which I'll bend, bending, dear love, to thee. Those lips shall be my Delphos, and shall speak, Laws to my footsteps, color to my cheek, Trembling or steadfastness to this same voice, And of three sweetest pleasurings the choice. And that affectionate light, those diamond things, those eyes, those passions, those supreme pearl springs, shall be my grief, or twinkle me to pleasure. Say, is not bliss within our perfect seizure? Oh, that I could not doubt, the mountaineer, thus strove by fancies vain and crude to clear. His briared path to some tranquility, it gave bright gladness to his lady's eye. And yet the tears she wept were tears of sorrow, answering thus just as the golden morrow beamed upward from the valleys of the east. Oh, that the flutter of this heart had ceased, or the sweet name of love had passed away, young feathered tyrant by a swift decay. Wilt thou devote this body to the earth, and I do think that at my very birth I lisped thy blooming titles inwardly, for at the first, first dawn and thought of thee, with uplift hands I bless the stars of heaven. Art thou not cruel? Ever have I striven to think thee kind, but ah, it will not do. Yet when a child I heard that kisses drew, favor from thee, and so I gave and gave to the void air bidding them find out love. But when I came to feel how far above, all fancy pride and fickle maidenhood, all earthly pleasure, all imagined good, was the warm tremble of a devout kiss, even then that moment at the thought of this. Fainting I fell into a bed of flowers, and languished there three days, ye milder powers. Am I not cruelly wronged? Believe, believe me, dear Endymion, were I to weave, with my own fancies, garlands of sweet life. Thou shouldst be one of all, ah, bitter strife. I may not be thy love, I am forbidden. Indeed I am thwarted, affrighted, chidden, by things I trembled at, and gorgon wrath twice hast thou asked whither I went henceforth. Ask me no more, I may not utter it, nor may I be thy love, we might commit ourselves at once to vengeance, we might die, we might embrace and die, voluptuous thought, 
Enlarge not to my hunger, or I'm caught. In trammels of perverse deliciousness, No, no, that shall not be, thee will I bless. Bid a long adieu. The carrion, no word returned, both lovelorn, silent, wan. Into the valleys green together went, Fire wandering, they were perforce content. To sit beneath a fair lone beechen tree, nor at each other gazed, but heavily poured on its hazel cirque of shedded leaves. End of section seventeen. Section eighteen of Endymion. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Kurt from tucson arizona endymion by john keats book number four lines seven seven six to one thousand twelve endymion unhappy it nigh grieves me to behold thee thus in last extreme and skied ere this but truly that i deem truth the best music in a first-born song. Thy lute-voiced brother will I sing ere long, and thou shalt aid, hast thou not aided me? Yes, moonlight emperor, felicity has been thy mead for many thousand years, yet often have I on the brink of tears, mourned as if yet thou wert a forester, forgetting the old tale he did not stir. His eyes from the dead leaves, or one small pulse of joy he might have felt, the spirit cults. Unfaded amaranth, when wild it strays through the old garden ground of boyish days. A little onward ran the very stream, by which he took his first soft poppy dream. And on the very bark against which he lent a crescent, he had carved, and round it spent. His skill in little stars, the teeming tree, had swollen and greened the pious charactery. But not taken out, why there was not a slope up which he had not feared the antelope, and not a tree beneath whose rooty shade he had not with his tamed leopards played, nor could an arrow light or javelin fly in the air where his had never been. And yet he knew it not. O oh, treachery! Why does his lady smile, pleasing her eye? With all his sorrowing, he sees her not. But whoso stares on him, his sister sure, Peona of the woods, can she endure? Impossible! How dearly they embrace! His lady smiles, delight is in her face. It is no treachery, dear brother mine. And Dimion, weep not so, why shouldst thou pine when all great Latmos so exalt will be? Thank the great gods, and look not bitterly, and speak not one pale word, and sigh no more. Sure I will not believe thou hast such store of grief to last thee to my kiss again. Thou surely canst not bear a mind in pain. Come hand in hand with one so beautiful. Be happy, both of you, for I will pull the flowers of autumn for your coronals. Pan's holy priest for young Endymion calls. And when he is restored, thou fairest dame, shall be our queen now, is it not a shame? To see ye thus not very, very sad, Perhaps ye are too happy to be glad. Oh, feel as if it were a common day, Free-voiced as one who never was away. No tongue shall ask whence come ye, but ye shall. Be gods of your own rest imperial. Not even I for one whole month will pry, into the hours that have passed us by. Since in my arbor I did sing to thee, O Hermes, on this very night will be a hymning up to Cynthia, queen of light, 
For the soothsayers, old saw yesternight, for good visions in the air whence will befall, as say these sages health perpetual, to shepherds and their flocks, and furthermore, in Dion's face they read the gentle lore. Therefore, for her these vesper carols are, our friends will all be there from nigh and far. Many upon thy death have ditties made, and many even now their foreheads shade with cypress on a day of sacrifice. New singing for our maids shalt thou device, and pluck the sorrow from our huntsmen's brows. Tell me, my lady queen, how to espouse this wayward brother to his rightful joys. His eyes are on thee bent as thou didst poise. His fate most goddess-like, help me, I pray, to lure Endymion, dear brother, say. What ails thee? He could not bear no more, and so bent his soul fiercely like a spiritual bow, and twanged it inwardly and calmly said, I would have thee my only friend, sweet maid, my only visitor, not ignorant, though, that these deceptions which for pleasure go, among men are pleasures real as real may be, but there are higher ones I may not see, if impiously an earthly realm I take, since I saw thee I have been wide awake, night after night and day by day until... Of the Empyrean I have drunk my fill. Let it content thee, sister, seeing me. More happy than betides mortality. A hermit young I'll live in mossy cave, Where thou alone shalt come to me and lave. Thy spirit in the wonders I shall tell. Through me the shepherd realm shall prosper well. For to thy tongue will I all health confide, and for my sake let this young maid abide. With thee as a dear sister, thou alone, Peona, mayst return to me, I own. This may sound strangely, but when, dearest girl, thou seest it for my happiness, no pearl, will trespass down these cheeks, companion fair, wilt be content to dwell with her, to share. This sister's love with me like one resigned and bent by circumstance and thereby blind. In self-commitment, thus that meek unknown, I but a buzzing by my ears has flown. Of jubilee to Diane, truth I heard. Well then, I see there is no little bird. Tender soever, but is Jove's own care. Long have I sought for rest and unaware. Behold, I find it so exalted too, so after my own heart I knew I knew there was a place untenanted in it. In that same void, white chastity shall sit and monitor me nightly to lone slumber. With sanest lips I vow me to the number of Diane's sisterhood and kind lady. With thy good help, this very night shall see my future days to her fain consecrate. As feels a dreamer what doth most create. His own particular fright, so these three felt, or like one who in after ages knelt, to Lucifer or Baal when he'd pine, after a little sleep or when in mine. Far underground a sleeper meets his friends who know him not, each diligently bends towards common thoughts and things for very fear, striving their ghastly malady to cheer by thinking it a thing of yes and no that housewives talk of but the spirit blow was struck and all were dreamers at the last, and Dimian said, are not our faiths all cast? Why stand we here? Adieu, ye tender pair. Adieu, whereat those maidens with wild stare. Walk dizzily away, pained and hot. His eyes went after them until they got. Near to a cypress grove whose deadly maw, in one swift moment, would what then he saw. 
and gulf forever. Stay, he cried, ah, stay. Turn, damsels, hist, one word I have to say. Sweet Indian, I would see thee once again. It is a thing I dote on, so I'd fain. Piona, ye should hand in hand repair into those holy groves that silent air. Behind great Diane's temple I'll be yon, at Vesper's earliest twinkle, they are gone. But once, once again, at this he pressed, his hands against his face, and then did rest, his head upon a mossy hillock green, and so remained as he a corpse had been, all the long day save when he scantily lifted his eyes abroad to see how shadows shifted, with the slow move of time, sluggish and weary, until the poplar tops and journey dreary had reached the river's brim, then up he rose, and slowly as that very river flows, walked towards the temple grove with this lament. Why such a golden eve? The breeze is sent, careful and soft that not a leaf may fall before the serene father of them all bows down his summer head below the west now am i of breath speech and speed possessed but at the setting i must bid adieu to her for the last time night will strew on the damp grass myriads of lingering leaves and with them shall i die nor much it grieves to die when summer dies on the cold sward. Why, I have been a butterfly, a lord, of flowers, garlands, love knots, silly posies, groves, meadows, melodies, and arbor roses. My kingdom's at its death, and just it is, that I should die with it, so in all this. We miscal grief, bail, sorrow, heartbreak, woe. What is there to plain of by Titan's foe? I am but rightly served. So saying, he tripped lightly on in sort of deathful glee, laughing at the clear stream and setting sun, as though they jests had been, nor had he done, his laugh at nature's holy countenance until that grove appeared as if perchance and then his tongue with sober seemly head gave utterance as he entered ha i said king of the butterflies but by this gloom and by old radamanthus tongue of doom this dusk religion pomp of solitude and the promethean clay by thief endued by old Saturn's forelock, by his head, shook with eternal palsy, I did wed myself to things of light from infancy, and thus to be cast out, thus lorn to die, is sure enough to make a mortal man grow impious. So he inwardly began on things for which no wording can be found, deeper and deeper sinking until drowned beyond the reach of music for the choir of cynthia he heard not through rough briar nor muffling thicket interposed to dull the vesper hymn far swollen soft and fall through the dark pillars of those sylvan aisles he saw not the two maidens nor their smiles when as primroses gathered at midnight by chilly fingered spring unhappy white Endymion, said Piona, we are here. What wouldst thou ere we all are laid on beer? Then he embraced her, and his lady's hand pressed, saying, Sister, I would have command, if it were heaven's will on our sad fate, at which that dark-eyed stranger stood elate, and said in a new voice, but sweet as love, to Endymion's amaze, by Cupid's dove, and so thou shalt, and by the lily truth of my own breast thou shalt, beloved youth. And as she spake, into her face there came light as reflected from a silver flame. Her long black hair swelled ampler in display 
full golden in her eyes, a brighter day, dawn blue and full of love, I he beheld. Phoebe, his passion, joyous she upheld, her lucid bow continuing thus, drear, drear has our delaying been, but foolish fear withheld me first, and then decrees of fate, and then twas fit that from this mortal state thou shouldst my love by some unlooked-for change be spiritualized peona we shall range these forests and to thee thy safe shall be as was thy cradle hither shalt thou flee to meet us many a time next cynthia bright peona kissed and blessed with fair good night her brother kissed her too and knelt adown before his goddess in a blissful swoon she gave her fair hands to him, and behold, before three swiftest kisses he had told, they vanished far away. Peona went home through the gloomy wood in wonderment. The End End of Section 18 End of Endymion by John Keats